Kitchen is a meeting conducted in the public, but is not a meeting of the public. There is a time for public participation during the meeting as indicated in the agenda. The purpose of today's meeting is to conduct regular business that requires action by the board. These items may include those discussed at a previous meeting or presented to the board discussion this evening. As a courtesy, please turn off your, and silence your cell phones and stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The Indigenous Land Acknowledgement Statement. Mount Pleasant Public Schools is honored to acknowledge the Anishinaabe people whose traditional land we are gathered on today. To recognize the Anishinaabe people and their ancestral land is our expression of gratitude and appreciation and a way of honoring the indigenous people who have been living and working on the land since time immemorial, and whose land on which the Saginaw Chippewa Indian tribe have resided and who have continued to reside on for centuries. We feel it is important to understand the long-standing history of the land and to seek to understand our place within that history. Next is roll call. Courtney? Dana Hawkins? Here. Tim Odekirk? Here. Willene Pengel? Here. Courtney Stegman? Here. Jessica Jernigan? Here. Sheila Murphy? Here. Amy Bond? Here. All right, next is the approval of the agenda. Does anything have any, anything that they wanted to add to it tonight or any changes that they made? Okay, not seeing any. Um, next is the superintendent, or sorry, superintendent report. Good evening, everyone. On our agenda, we do have the student board of education representative report, but because it's summer break, she will not be here this evening. Um, so our first report under superintendent reports is the annual athletic update with Mr. Jim Conway. Thanks for being here, Jim. Good evening, all. Yeah, it's my pleasure again after a uh, different uh, athletic season to report to you, and we're still smiling, so that's a good thing. So. I'll briefly go over the report. I believe everyone has it in front of you. Uh, another successful season for Euler Athletics with everything that was, was handed to us. Um, I, I have to say, I think the kids, the kids really responded um, very well and, and, and in a, a very strange way. I think this, this whole experience was a good educational learning tool for them. Um, specifically, when we had to, when the MHSAA uh, mandated that we COVID test the kids, um, it, just how they handled it, what, you know, whether you believe in the test or not, it's, it's how they handled it and how they, how they helped each other. Uh, it, it was just a really neat experience to be on the front line and see that. And that, this was, this was through sixth graders, through twelfth graders. So it was, it was, uh, it, it's, it was uh, very interesting. But I, I have to give the kids a, an A plus on on how they handled things, and and certainly appreciate that. Um, I'm sure it's something that they will never forget in their high school and middle school careers uh, as they look back. But um, uh, athletic uh, facts here. We continue to uh, hopefully do the right thing here. Uh, as you can see, we offer 16 sports. Uh, 13 offerings for the boys and, and 13 offerings for the girls. Uh, we, we offered 40 teams and that was split across. Uh, we finally had a freshman girls basketball team for the first time in six, seven years and, and that was successful. So that was wonderful. That pulled us up to uh, 20 girls uh, teams and, and uh, equal to 20 boys teams. So as you can see, 38% of our current student body participate in at least one sport. Uh, we feel good about that, down uh, maybe a tick. Uh, we've been in the 40s, you know, the low 40s. Uh, there were times that, uh, you know, we were a little bit closer, you know, 45, 46, but uh, sign of the times, I think, and talking to my colleagues and looking at numbers, you know, we're, we're right there um, where, where we should be, and, and you can see that. Uh, one credit, more credit, this is my time where I can credit people actually, is we continually employ and we're fortunate to have a lot of Mount Pleasant Public School employees coach our kids. 
and we know coaching is teaching. So when you can get teachers to coach, that they, you know that that's what you want. We also have you know I'll pick on Mr. Windrow. You know he's he's been here you know for four decades, and we're very fortunate. He's in the halls every day with our kids, and you know he he coaches um, you know in two of our sports, uh, which is fantastic. So as you can see, of the 40 sports we had, 28 of them are coached by full-time Mount Pleasant Public School employees, and I will tell you across the state that is a that that is a huge number. I mean, many, many, many school districts um, struggle to find coaches, let alone employees that coach. I was in an MH or I was in a, a Saginaw Valley League meeting this morning, and as of this morning, there are 37 head girls basketball coaching openings in the state of Michigan. 37 schools are looking for. Uh, head girls basketball coaches and then you know uh, across the board you can see that so uh, believe it or not coaches do not fall out of trees we don't grow them um, so when we get good ones we we, we certainly want to want to embrace that and and uh, you know thank them for all their efforts you can see the percentages there of the kids uh, the ninth graders 38 percent 10th graders 37 percent 11th graders 37 percent and 12th graders is 41 percent this was it, generally, that number will decline as kids get older. Um, part of it is when you get to the varsity level, you know, unfortunately, we do cut kids based on roster size. Um, so the 41% uh, in a senior class, is it, that's been higher than normal. So I felt very, very strong about that. Uh, and they had a good year. And, and maybe it was because some of them couldn't play last year <laughs> that, uh, you know, they said, hey, I'm going to go out, you know, I'm, I'm going to go out with a, uh, some pri Oiler pride and, and play my senior year. So um, we're fortunate to have that. One thing we're very proud of, again, is the academic summary. As you can see, our, our, the Saginaw Valley League recognizes kids 3.3 or better or higher cumulative is, uh, is our all academic for all league, and those kids get a certificate at their banquet. But uh, very proud, you know, the females again lead the way at 73% uh, of those kids that participate in athletics were 3.3 and better. And then 51% of the boys, and, and uh, I, I do tell the boys that stat uh, probably once or twice a year during the school year. So. Um, but feel very good about that, where the kids are progressing uh, academically. The, the next uh, page there, or slide, is just the sports offering. As you can see, uh, uh, cross country, we'll start with varsity boys. And then in the parentheses, that's where we finished in an extremely competitive league. You know, when people see that, um, they say, oh, boy, you know, seventh, fifth, you know, fourth, third, sixth. Well, I can tell you this, we, we, uh, we just finished the, the spring state championships last weekend. Grand Blank, who's in our conference, just won the boys' baseball state championships, Division I, as well as the boys' uh, state championships. And then you have the Midland Dows, where tennis and swimming and that type of thing. And, and uh, this is an extremely competitive athletic league, and uh, we like that, actually. So that uh, um, you can see there. One note, uh, the winner, the winner was, was reduced, obviously, due to the pandemic. Um, where, and we're gonna talk hockey here in a little bit, but generally we would play 25 regular season hockey games. This year we played seven. Um, basketball, you play 20. I think we end up playing, we want, we want a game or two in the districts for boys and one one in girls. So I think we end up playing 13 or 14 of, of, of those games. Um, so the, the winter was definitely shortened, um, but at least the kids had an opportunity to compete, be with their friends, be with their colleagues and, and uh, kind of get away from um, you know, the real world and, and, and uh, uh, you know, represent Mount Pleasant. So, and then the spring, spring went um, very well. Uh, I was just talking earlier today. Uh, very interesting with the spring, we did not have one rain out in spring sports. And some of you that have had kids <laughs> that were spring athletes understand Michigan Springs can be very, very difficult to work with. So. The best news, I guess, this, this sports year was our spring. The weather was phenomenal. If you remember, the first three weeks in April were fantastic. Um, and then May stayed dry, got a little chilly there in the middle, but uh, you know the softball parents and the track parents and soccer parents brought an extra blanket, but, but it stayed dry, so that, that helped the athletic director because making up these games um, becomes very difficult, especially you know, with, with the, the virus going around. So. As you see at the bottom there, the Dick Leach uh, Award, that is for each sport based on how many teams play, based on where you finish. 
you get X amount of points, and then that accumulation of points uh, at the end is, is added. So we finish ninth for the boys and, and sixth for the girls, which is about where we were last year. I think the girls might have improved a spot or two um, from last year, so uh, heading in the right direction. As always, uh, you can see the MHSA. Um, two things. Number one, you know our, our location is wonderful to host uh, athletic events. You know across the state with the Michigan High School Athletic Association, but then also our facilities continue to lend uh, more emails today about will you host next year and. I'm still not very smart and click yes, and one of these years I'll, I'll wise up and say no, let somebody else do it. But it, uh, it's a chance to show off kind of our, our neighborhood, if you will. So we will continue to host those events. A couple of them were hosted at, uh, at CMU, so we still have that relationship. To, uh, two weeks ago, a week ago Saturday, we hosted a Super Region for baseball. And then last Tuesday, uh, we, we hosted the uh, girls soccer or the girls softball quarterfinals. So uh, th that will continue. Uh, multiple, multiple sport participation, this has been a, a, an emphasis with the MHSA. We're probably on the third or fourth, fifth year of, of, of a heavy emphasis. Uh, we try to talk with kids. I try to motivate coaches to share student athletes, if you will. Um, we are certainly in an age of specialization as, as you look across the country. Everybody wants that, uh, you know, that Division I scholarship. We know less than 2% of kids get a Division I scholarship. We also know now that uh, it's going to make it tougher because the Supreme Court ruled this morning that now college athletes will be paid. And now they want to know, you know how much and how they're going to pay and that type of thing. So, so now there's, there's parents there that uh, not only see the, the scholarship out there, but potentially uh, where, where their kids can, may get paid to play sports. Um, if, if they're certainly good enough. So uh, it, it, the numbers dictate there. Um, Pretty decent there, number of, number of boys that play two or more sports, 101, and, and then the girls that play two or more sports, 75. We will continually work on that, um, successful athletic programs. We're a big school, a little over 1,000 kids, which sounds big, but, but when we start um, specializing and kids only play one sport, that shrinks your pool down quite um, quite, quite dramatically. So we need to, in Mount Pleasant, and I wish uh, more schools did it, we really need to share athletes from a winter to a spring to a fall, that type of thing. It, it can be done, and, and uh, we constantly talk about that with coaches. We, we, we try to work with each other, and, and um, it's, it's difficult, and not only with that, but then you're fighting the AAUs and the clubs and that type of thing. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll keep going. We'll keep going. Just a, a few of the kids here I, I, I always add, and again, I have to caveat this with these are, you know, the athletes known to be competing, and, and already I, I realize I left off Andrew Funnel should be under baseball. He's going to join Michael Coughlin at Mid-Michigan. So congratulations to, uh, to Andrew. Uh, this, is the, this is the second year in a row we are sending a student athlete to the Ivy League, which is fantastic. Um, of course, Tyler Huneman last year went to, um, he's at Harvard playing football, but hasn't played yet, of course, because of the pandemic. But uh, Mackenzie will join him in the Ivy, and I, and I know they're friends, and, and they, they've already you know, started the trash talk between them and this and that. So it'll, it'll be neat to have, have two of those out there. And you can see you know, across the board, um, you know, kids, kids from different sports are uh, going to continue on, which is fantastic. Any questions on athletics or? All righty. No, but I'd like to thank you and your team and the trainers for doing all of the extra work you had to do this year, which was a significant load of work. So thank you for all of that. I well, I appreciate that. And, and, and our trainer, you know, Kathleen, she did, a, she did a fantastic job. And, and we, had, we had, you know, teachers in the building step up and help with our COVID team. And, and uh, I need to thank the COVID team downtown. That's certainly not easy when I call and, you know, we had a positive then all of a sudden their day <laughs> gets extremely busy so but but I think overall it was uh, uh, we got through it and and uh, let's not do it again you know <laughs> if, the, if the board has the power to do that let's not do it again so <laughs> Jen can I can I can we talk hockey at this point yeah yeah okay okay so um, I'm, I'm gonna bring up mr. Bob Weisenberger here we, we um, We've had hockey for 13 years. It has been solely a Mount Pleasant public school hockey program. 
meaning if you didn't attend Mount Pleasant High School, you couldn't play for our hockey program. The last couple years, the numbers have dipped, um, which is unfortunate. So we are, we are now at the point where we have to look at alternatives. Um, the easy thing to do would be to say, no more hockey. Nobody wants that. Your competitors, we're, we're competitors. Uh, we would like to see this hockey program continue. Our, our opponents in the Saginaw Valley League wants to see hockey continue. The MHSA wants to see us continue. So we are, we are investigating, looking into a cooperative program, which is allowable by the MHSA. Cooperative program basically means we will select certain schools, neighboring schools, that the kids would still go to the neighboring schools, but they could play hockey for Mount Pleasant. Whether the name changes or not, that's something that you know we, we work down the road. Um, but that's 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 kind of the state of the union where we are. We we, we need bodies in skates to continue this this going. And and um, you know Bob and his crew have have done a, a good job of research. I will say this, and I'll let Bob speak. 44% of the teams that play high school hockey are now co-opted in the state of Michigan. And these schools are bigger than us. East Kentwood, who has a hockey rink, I don't know if you've been to East Kentwood, but it's like a community college, it's a very large facility, they co op a hockey program, and, and, and many, many do. So we've, we've me, <laughs> tried to hang in there as long as possible, but we're to the point now where we, we feel like we have to discuss a, a, a co-op. Um, to kind of a survival. So I'll, uh, I'll get out of the way and let Bob talk here real quickly and, and uh, fill you in on the state of hockey. Thanks, Jim. Thank you for allowing us the opportunity here. It's kind of a bigger picture thing. I'm, I'm a longtime advocate of, uh, of the recreation sportsplex here in Mount Pleasant and uh, as an integral part of that sportsplex that adds a lot, I think, arguably adds a, quite a bit to this community um, and built with, you know, no tax dollars, heavy, heavy philanthropy and effort to, uh, to make that a unique thing for all of us in the community. Ice skating was the genesis of the program, whether it's figure skating, youth skating or Mount Pleasant High School hockey. 13 years ago, we petitioned the uh, Mount Pleasant School Board and they graciously allowed us the opportunity saying, understand this, you know, we're not gonna be, we're not gonna be funding for the Mount Pleasant High School hockey. It's a pay to play sport and uh, we had all the numbers and they had us go out and raise an additional 60 to 70 thousand dollars from people just giving money to support area skating because once they get into high school they start we start to lose the numbers and just getting a little tired of playing for grandpa and grandma and uh, and mom and dad and so we've held those numbers for 13 years We've been Mount Pleasant High School Oiler Hockey. But what's most important for the area skaters and is to be able to play area high school hockey. And right now, our numbers, you know, won't sustain that. The numbers of skaters remains static. It remains steady. Whereas many places throughout the country those numbers are down, but we're remaining higher. It's just the number of kids that live in Mount Pleasant, or go to Mount Pleasant High School, Mount Pleasant Public Schools. So kids from Alma, Shepherd, Ithaca, Beale City, Sacred Heart, Clare, um, Shepherd are part of the skating program because other rinks haven't survived. We have survived. And it's Ice skating and high school hockey is integral to the ice rink's physical return. And in turn, the ice rink is important to the physical nature of the sportsplex. So I'm here not only as a 
60 year plus Mount Pleasant resident and a Mount Pleasant High School graduate and a Mount Pleasant High School hockey enthusiast, but I'm here for the rec center. I'm here for the sportsplex and um, I'm just delighted that you would at least hear me out and hear Jim out and, uh, and uh, consider allowing us to be a co-op to gather enough players to not put our kids, this year was the first year we kind of dipped below a, 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 a real tipping point. And so for 13 years we've sustained ourselves and now the numbers of a lot of people have moved to the you know, outside the school district and have their kids going there. Bottom line is that I appreciate you thinking about it and I'm here for the uh, rec center as well as for the kids in the area uh, ice skating. So thank you for hearing me out. Appreciate it. Can I ask you a question? Oh, certainly. Um, are the student athletes who are currently involved in hockey and their families, do they support this move? Do they want to keep playing as a co-op? Absolutely. There, there are 140 uh, high, school, high school hockey teams in the state. 60 of them are co-op. Jim will tell you the exact numbers maybe, but five years ago, there maybe was two dozen co-ops. Make no mistake, this is a survival issue and um, we have kept the cost the same and the families uh, have endorsed this uh, area of skating. If you, I'm certain if I ask you guys if you've ever been to the, to the rec center out there, you'd say yes or driven by it. It, it rocks, that place is busy and the, and the families truly support. Our numbers in the Amateur Hockey Association are very level. We've, done a whale of a job enticing people and when skating rinks that operate part-time in Gladwin or um, other communities that don't have them they they have their kids come here so yes I would say the families genuinely support the idea of co-op in fact Jim will tell you with a half smile on he's he's had to tell people no for 13 years we aren't going to have it because They've been all asking for it so that their kids can play. But uh, it's been a good ride. It's just kind of uh, met, its, uh, met its day. And if we, need, we really truly need to keep it going for the physical strength of the uh, sportsplex there. So I guess I have a follow-up question as well. I'm right here. Um, the advantage of the cooperative program seems pretty obvious from a recruitment point of view. What are the, is there any drawbacks to having such a cooperative program that you didn't go there earlier? Um, no, great, great question. And Jim may be a little better to uh, address those. I, I would say the only drawback is, um, and we're cognizant of, of the, the total enrollment. So the way sports works, obviously they, they take, in hockey there's three divisions, so they just cut it. They take the top 33% enrollment schools and that's division one the the middle 33 is going to be division two and then and then we we have been although we're a class a high school we have always been in the lower hockey division so w between bob and i and and our and our crack math skills we think uh you know depending on which schools join and which do not that we would we would stay in that division we would move up a division um which on paper should be tougher but we really we're really willing to sacrifice that just so these kids can play hockey and continually represent uh, you know, our high school. So that's really the only drawback. Um, I've talked to a lot of cooperative programs in the last month or so. Um, you know, there's certainly going to be a philosophy and, and uh, you know, our eligibility rules are different than Shepard's eligibility rules, which are different than Beal's uh, eligibility rules, but teams that have co-opted have been able to navigate and, and massage all that and work through it. So um, I think we can handle that, but it's, it's going from that division three up, up a level would be, probably be the only drawback. But this guy's a competitor and he says, let's do it, so. Thank you. 
I, I believe, Jim, our plan was at this point to come back to the board at our July meeting with specific information um, regarding what schools we would be co-oping with and then ask for official board approval at that point. That's correct. If I'm not mistaken, MHSA has a deadline of August. Uh, August 15th, we'd have to alert the, okay. the MHSA that we're joined into a cooperative program. Okay. And, and then... Uh, and then we took the, I took the step this morning with the league, and, and the league is aware of it, and they're aware of this meeting and the July 17th meeting, and, and then I will, based on that, the results of that meeting, I will let them know what direction we go. Does anyone have any other questions for Jim or Bob? No, but thank you for all of your hard work. A lot of effort has gone into that, to see the, those kids be able to still succeed at a sport. Yep. End of the day, it's all fun. Still a lot of fun. Thank you. Right, thank you. Next under my report is the PSC annual report. And here to present that is Erin King, uh, PSC co-chair. Thank you for being here, Erin. Good evening. Thank you for having me. I think you all have the report linked and we're given slides also. So I'm going to go through that report now. And the professional study committee, the PSC, has many different members, and you'll see that on your third slide. And I'm the chair this year, which is kind of a unique position for me to be in, prior being a teacher. And generally, this role is held by a teacher. And just in light of this school year, it was tricky to have somebody move into that role mid-year. So I continued in this spot, and then will remain a member next year. But there will be a teacher that will take over the role of chair next year. Um, and you can see the members there. There's generally a lower L representation. There is um, two, Allison Carr and Katie Hoyle. And then we have high school representation as well with um, Christy Boltz that you can see listed next. We have Wendy Hoyle from the middle school. And then on the other side, on the right-hand side, is our admin that you can see listed there, along with Wendy Apple as our ex-officio through MPEA. The next slide shows the professional study committee process. So it kind of shows you both sides of what happens through the MPEA realm and then what happens on the admin side and how the two sides work together to make sure there is accurate representation on the committee so that curriculum isn't just chosen by the teachers without being brought to a committee and then to the board and vice versa, not just chosen by the admin and then brought to the board. So it really is wonderful and I think a unique process that our school has, that our district has, and that allows um, our experts, which are our teachers, to make sure that they're bringing curriculum forth and doing the study that's involved with that, and then bringing that to the PSC committee and then to the board. A district-wide curriculum provides a framework for what all students are expected to know, do, and be able to perform. It is also vital that the curriculum is aligned across grade levels and that it addresses the requirements identified through both Michigan and national standards for teaching and learning. And that's a goal from PSC that we really try to hold true to. PSC supports the Board of Ed in lots of different ways, and they're listed there. So a lot of, um, at the beginning of the year, each year, there will be a new staff, and they'll say, what is PSC? They'll hear that. And so we'll send out an email to the whole um, staff that will say, okay, this is a, what PSC stands for, this is what PSC does, and this is why we have it. And that's kind of what all of those bullets outline as well. Um, the key within the Professional Study Committee is it's a collaborative group that works together. It's kind of that bridge, teaching staff, admin, coming together to make sure that we're doing what's best for kids and following our state and national standards, and then making sure that we're providing a rigorous curriculum for our students. There are many ways that staff and community members participate in this process, and these include serving as a task force or study team member, being a member of the building's school improvement team, leading or participating in grade level or department meetings, using best practice research for instructing students, basing instructional decisions on student data, serving on PSC, sharing ideas for PSC, and supporting curriculum work as members of the Board of Education. And we're so thankful for this process. And as I said, it's unique um, to our district. This is the third district that I've worked in. And um, I think until you've worked somewhere else, you don't see the difference that a program like this can make or a team like this can make. And I have seen it firsthand. The next part of our our annual report is the curriculum cycle focus area. And 
secondary business and technology is our first slide. But before I go into that, the, generally PSC presents in December and then PSC presents again in January. This year is different because there wasn't, our, our process ran a little bit differently due to COVID, which you've heard a thousand times this year. So we did not present in December because so much of our work was still continuing and there wasn't enough to present on as there is in typical years. So this work, the Secondary Business and Technology Task Force, you've uh, excuse me, already approved, it's done. It was in the December, would have been a December report, but I still put it in here because this is the annual report. And since we didn't do a December report, I wanted to make sure this showed a representation of what was completed this year. So Secondary Business and Technology Task Force, um, I listed everything there, but that was approved in December. And then next is the out of cycle requests for 2021. And we have MPMS World Language Consent Form, which again was already brought to you, but I wanted to include that as yearly work. And that was the credit, no credit option for Spanish. The next one is DK Big Day Curriculum Journeys. And we adopted Journeys several years ago. I believe we were talking and we were thinking that it's been five years. Correct me if I'm wrong, Linda. I think this is our um, sixth year currently right now. We had a um, kind of a pilot year where we had teachers try it, and then this is our fifth year of implementation for um, K-5 journeys for reading. We had handwriting without tears in the past for DK, and it was working well. It wasn't that it wasn't working. However, we found that there was a component that we didn't know about prior that we tried last year that was for pre-K, or we call it in Mount Pleasant, DK. So we tried that out and the teachers loved it. Our experts said, this is what we wanna do. This helps our students being prepared for kindergarten. They're using the same language, seeing the same components, but at their level. So we decided this was best. Then checked um, in with you and this was the route that we wanted to go. So that was purchased in December, 2020. Their curriculum cycle focus areas that are still in progress are um, the Elementary Secondary World Studies Task Force and the charge is listed there. This group really um, hit the ground running this year and they were ready um, to make sure, okay, we, we wanna know what our charge is right away, even before you're ready to give it to us because we're ready to do the work. They had standards that were adopted in February last year and we know that COVID kind of put a halt on some of that work. So this task force continued working and they're meeting um, even this summer, I think they met a little bit on June 9th and then they're continuing to meet and we'll finish up this work hopefully next year in November. You can see the charge outlined there. There were a few additions to this charge. Generally, there's a charge that's issued and it has kind of the same components. You can see pacing guides, common assessments, course description, syllabus, all of those things. We added a few other pieces in. We wanted them to take a look at diversity. We wanted them to take a look at cross-curricular alignment and look at um, integration across grade levels also, making sure there's alignment with middle school and high school. The next slide shows the end of their charge and we wanted them to answer the following in their report. How is diversity addressed in your content area with regard to culture, gender, race, or religion? And then we did um, discuss with them the board policy also. And then I, when I met with them, they had quite a few questions about what this looked like and the conversation's been awesome and they're continuing this work and middle school is meeting with high school to make sure that we're covering everything that we can in the best way that we can for all of our students. The task force timeline is listed there as well. And as I said, our hope is that they would finish um, next year and maybe present to us in October, and then we'd be ready to present to you in November so that they'd be ready um, for that course book if they have any changes when it needs to be ready for January 2022. I always say that backwards. I hope that was right. Um, and then our elementary, we would like them to be wrapped up in March 2022. And then um, they would come to us then, we would come to you probably in April, and then it would be ready for that following year in case there needed to be items purchased or things like that. We always wanna make sure that's ready so that over the summer, teachers could get acclimated with that material. And MPHS had a science task force um, preview charge given, which is not common. Um, this is my fifth year or sixth year on PSC, and I don't think we've given a preview charge before. But again, we have a group just like World Studies that was ready to hit the ground running. And we weren't quite, quite ready at PSC because their cycle starts next year. But they said, hey, we wanna work this summer. We really are ready to make sure that this summer we can put the work in and maybe during the school year it's a little bit trickier to have that time. So we issued them a preview charge just for the high school 
and the middle school charge will mirror that, but the middle school wasn't quite ready at this point to work this summer, and then they will work on their traditional schedule next year. So you can see an issue of that task force preview charge there, and then also their timeline. Generally, the secondary follows a timeline of January to the following December, and then elementary follows the school year. And the reason for that is just in case there's changes with courses, they need to be ready to be put into that course book in January so that students can schedule class as well. So the counselors don't go quite as crazy when they're scheduling classes for students. We have points of pride for 2021. Um, it was, if I'm being 100% honest with you, it was really, really difficult this year to be completely transparent with communication and make sure I was um, juggling all of the balls that I was trying to juggle. And I worked really hard. I know I dropped lots of them, and once I did, I tried to fix that and make sure we were meeting. So I really feel like communication is a priority, and it was a priority especially this year, because we knew people are being asked to do more than they've ever been asked to do. And we all feel like there's less time, even though there's the same amount of time. So we really tried hard to make sure there were email updates that were going out after meetings. And that way staff knew what was happening within the PLC realm. And um, after each email, there were lots of questions, which is awesome. That shows people are reading what's coming to them. And that shows that they're interested in the work that's affecting them as Mount Pleasant Public School employees. So communication is a point of pride. As well as face-to-face -face meetings, again, that was really difficult this year. Um, due to scheduling and COVID and um, just the logistics of the position that I'm in now and having time to, I don't have a prep period built in, which um, sounds amazing. If someone wants to implement that and give a principal a prep period, that sounds amazing, but it doesn't quite work that way. So it was really difficult for me during um, just certain times of the day to be able to meet, but that was a priority to make sure that we're able to meet face to face. That's always better than an email. That's always better than a phone call and I think we all feel like it's better than a Zoom at this point, is a face-to-face -face meeting. If you look on the next um, slide, it actually be two, thank you, Jennifer, um, on your page 28, that's the curriculum cycle review. And all we do each year is just roll that over so you'll see 1920 disappear next year, and then we'll just add um, 2425 onto the right of that. And there are small tweaks that we've made over the years because we wanted to make sure that one particular year didn't have a heavy year of study with really, really heavy curriculum areas all being at the same time. For example, we wouldn't want, if you look at 2021, we wouldn't want world studies to be also with English language arts, to be also with math. Those are all three very meaty areas that take a significant amount of time and cost more money because you're involving more people. So we really tried to spread that out and have only made small tweaks over the years. So I'm sure you're familiar with this if you've been on the board for a little bit. And if you're not, this is something that stays the same and it will just add another year onto the right after this year. So the recommendations for approval um, sound a little goofy also this year because really you already did this in December. But again, to represent our year, um, the annual report lists these items, which is approved secondary business and technology task force report and approved the Journey's Big Day curriculum, which you've already done both of those things. So if you look on slide 31, there is no cost, which is a rejoice moment, right? It says zero. Ginger's smiling at me with her eyes above her mask, um, saying thank you that there's zero dollars, right? Um, and if you look, Big Day was already approved in December, and that's the reference there that's cost and then everything else um, there wasn't a cost but I wanted to list that as I said for the annual report so we just are so thankful um, for this committee and for the work that they do and the time that they put in it isn't just one meeting a month there's lots that goes into that many of the members are working with task forces and having to field those emails and go to those meetings and be the liaison for PSC and it takes an immense amount of time and it is um, just a, a team effort and we appreciate all of that. Or do you have any questions for me about anything that you've seen so far, or anything about PSC? I, I have a small question, just trying to sure. understand your process. Sure. And so I was uh, familiar with how you ran the PSC. Yes. And then um, I think the part I'm, I'm working through is how your task force work. And so if I understand right, and feel free to correct me. Sure. Um, 
for a specific area, so let's just pick the one you had today, like world studies, mm -hmm. is there PSC members that are assigned to the specific task force and then build an additional group that then meets separately and then report back to PSC? Is that how that works? Yeah, you just nailed all of it. So I'll go through that one. That's a great example because it's going on right now. So for example, there's always a liaison from PSC. So in this instance, it's our high school principal. And then we have a liaison with PSC. And then there's also PSC chairs. So we have two PSC chairs, one's at the middle school level and one's at the high school level for the secondary. And then we have two... Ooh, there might be one in the elementary, but I know another admin has kind of tag team to help out. So I don't, I'm, on paper, I don't know if there's two or if there's one, but there's always representation across the secondary and the elementary. And then as we put this task force, to, or put the charge together, we try to meet as a PSC team and figure out, okay, who is going to be interested in this committee, first of all? Because you don't want to just appoint somebody if it's not an area of interest, and you want to make sure that it's someone that has leadership skills, someone that... Um, has, like I said, an interest, someone that is ready for this type of work, someone that is in that particular area. You wouldn't want a um, fifth grade teacher, obviously, on the secondary committee. So we really try to pay attention to that. Once we have agreement from all of the members that we've looked at together as an admin team, reached out to principals that aren't on our committee, who do you think would be interested in this work? Who do you think would help us be successful? Once we've reached out to those people and they've said yes, then the charge is issued and the liaison meets with the task force members. In this instance, actually, Willeen, I met with the um, task force, the secondary, and then the elementary, I did not meet with them face-to-face. -face. Their liaison delivered the charge to them face-to-face, -face, and that's usually what happens is the liaison does that. Then there's a folder within the PSC drive that holds the agendas, the um, minutes, um, the sign-ins, and all curriculum work goes there. So myself and the liaison can look and check in and make sure that everything is on target according to the timeline given in the charge. And if there's questions, we can ask them. Generally, a small update is given at the next PSC meeting, and it's just kind of carried out throughout the year. So if there was a meeting in January, then we would give an update in February. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, it okay. does. Thank you. That, yes. does, that does help. And so then if I from what you've said, mm -hmm. um, if let's say I'm a teacher and I'm interested in being in a specific task force, mm -hmm. can I request that? Is that volunteer basis, yeah. not just by invitation? Yeah, I don't, I think normally it happens the other way. Um, there isn't usually somebody that says, hey, I wanna be a part of this, because a lot of times teachers won't know until, hey, we're gonna have this task force, and that's how they hear about it, so then they might say something. Okay. But usually what has happened in my experience is, oh, I know that this particular teacher has an interest here, we could ask them. So it, it definitely is not just handpicked. It's people that will have an interest or um, have been plugged in in a particular area already. But I know in this World Studies example, um, there was someone that reached out prior and said, oh, I really want to be on this, which I think isn't the norm just because usually that um, curriculum cycle overview isn't something that I think we're all thinking of right away, where this particular teacher was, ooh, I know this is coming up, I really want to be on this. So that does happen. And then if someone's not on the task force, those teachers that are, are expected to go out to their department and get information from their department, which then is part of the collective whole, so we have voice from everybody. All right, that was my next question, thank oh. you. <laughs> You're and welcome. So, and so then as a board, we then have one board member that attends the mm -hmm. PSC meetings, mm -hmm. and uh, this year it's you, Dana, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. That You're helps. welcome. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Aaron. So building off of that uh, strong presentation from the Professional Study Committee, <clears throat> excuse me, we want to move into the next topic under um, my report, which is the idea um, of really looking at our curriculum uh, through a variety of different lenses. So over the last several months, we've heard from our community with concerns regarding curriculum, regarding what is being taught and maybe what isn't being taught and how we could, um, we can address that. And so Linda and I are going to work together to uh, go through this presentation um, to give you an idea of what we've been working on and how we would like to move forward um, under the umbrella of cultural responsiveness within our curriculum. So you want to start, Linda? So this fits in nicely with what Erin just presented with PSC, and I wanted to kind of review a little bit of what we've been working on in the past year. So 
Um, obviously, social studies, world studies has been a focus of our learning over the course of the um, 2021 school year. The pandemic has thrown that into a wrench a little bit because we couldn't gather face to face as much as we wanted to. Um, and we wanted to be very thoughtful and int intentional with our work, trying to not pull teachers out of the classroom on the precious days that we could have in person instruction. So, but we did, um, we did task the social studies groups. I think the entire high school social studies department was actively involved in their task force. Um, and from the beginning, we were very um, aware and um, trying to be very intentional about how diversity is currently addressed in that, in that particular content area. The other thing that we're proud of being very actively involved in is project aware. And I bring that up because that kind of goes along nicely with all of our discussions about diversity. And Project AWARE is an amazing opportunity that we've been a part of um, thanks to a, a very large Saginaw Chippewa Indian Tribe grant that we were awarded um, at the beginning of the 2018-2019 school year. It was a $1.8 million per year grant, and with it we've been able to give our students five counselors. So it's been um, amazing. To, you heard from Kim Funnel last week, and she mentioned Stephen Wheeler in the, in the um, role that he plays at Way Oasis, and so each of our buildings have the opportunity to, to um, have access to Project Aware counselors and some of the other learning that has gone along with that. Um, in year two, we, we started out very strong with Project Aware, um, a very big pro focus on trauma-informed, and so we were trained on resilience, and um, we've talked a lot about making sure our community was aware of this. And you may remember we started out strong with a wellness tailgate. We were, it was very welcoming and positive about wellness. And um, that was the same year that eventually the pandemic hit and we didn't really bring our, the prog progress that Project Aware brought us to full closure because we couldn't really um, end the year together. But we did manage to add calming corners. That was a, a large piece of our Project Aware funding um, and using those in the classroom. And we trained staff in youth first aid mental health. Almost all of our paraprofessional staff have participated in that training. Um, and, we, that, and all of this is part of the grant. So not just um, the five counselors, but a very well laid out expectation for professional development, professional learning for our teachers over the course of, of these five years. So you kind of see the plan there in front of you, the trauma-informed training for all staff, um, last year, the training was excellent. However, we had to participate virtually because we weren't allowed to gather together. Um, but midway through last year, we were able to um, participate in cultural training from Dr. J. Mark. And Dr. Mark's cultural training was two three-hour sessions, one with our DK5 staff, and then in the afternoon with our secondary staff. Um, and so if you, on slide four, Sorry if I'm talking too fast. <laughs> um, that is Dr. Mark's uh, biographical information, and he has been a very, uh, a very great um, asset to us as we start to go down the road of um, examining our cultural competence here in Mount Pleasant. And he has a very positive way of talking to all of us and um, kind of meeting us where we are at with our um, understanding of diversity and culture. So. Um, Dr. Mark, is uh, he's been in education since 1991, and now he is a consultant at the Oakland ISD. The workshop that we all participated on February 8th, the title of it was Cultural Proficiency, and so some of those live links, if you want to dig a little bit deeper, um, these slides kind of walked us through different ways that we could look at our own, um, our own self-assessment of where we are with with our with diversity and the sample on the slide is you know do you see me and when we walk into classrooms do we see a fair representation on our walls of all different kinds of students and um, disabilities abilities um, and different cultural um, components of our of our classrooms and so as we try to bring all this together oops slide six slide six is just another example of a cultural competence self assessment. We all did this virtually with Dr. Mark and you know, just kind of went through some of those questions so that we could see where we are at as individuals. No one had to report their score, um, but we, it was a good starting point for us to reflect on, on this journey. Um, on slide seven, I just kind of wanted to bring that back all together. Erin um, had mentioned that 
a few of our staff that the new standards for social studies were rolled out in February of 2019. Um, we sent a high school representative or two and a couple of um, a middle school representative and an elementary representative. And when, when they came back, they said that the content, the new, the social studies standards had been argued about in, at the Department of Education for several years. And it was, you know, just a tweak here, a word there. And finally, when they were rolled out, um, the, a common thread was that very little had changed with the content. They were, they were clearer, there were fewer standards, some were combined because there was some redundancy. But they did, the biggest emphasis was on a different approach to teaching the standards. A more of an emphasis on inquiry and instruction. Um, and that was, you know, that student voice and the whole child push, which has been a big part of Michigan's top 10 and 10 with the, looking at the whole child. So when we slide to slide eight, um, again, the, I like the quote from um, the career, the college career and civic life framework. It, talk, it says there's an added emphasis on developing student skills to become active and informed citizens. The idea that as opposed to, the idea is that opposed to just learning the what, students are asked to use critical and deeper thinking to examine the why. And then at the very bottom, organizational changes to the standards encourage students to examine multiple perspectives. So I think that all fits in with what we've been, we've been discussing lately. So. I've been doing all the talking. Do you want to? Talk? Well, sure. I can jump in here. So, so the idea would be as we move forward and we look at uh, what Erin just presented with the um, academic departments that would be up for review in the 21-22 school year, we would like to create an additional task force that would take an intentional, intensive look at our curriculum under the lens of culturally responsive curriculum. So Linda highlighted for us here the role that PSC plays in developing our curriculum, which works really nicely with what Erin just presented uh, to give you an idea of how that structure fits in. On this slide, I wanted to mention that our local Gratiot Isabella RESD is going to focus on social studies next year as well. Um, and over the course of my time with Mount Pleasant, we have participated in math essentials. So we get together with other professionals from other districts and kind of compare notes on um, kind of those standards that are absolutely non-negotiable. Um, in fact, I think one of, I think math is called non-negotiable standards and um, language arts is the high essential literacy standards. They want to take that approach with all of the Gratiot Isabella RESD now that the standards are out and then kind of come up with another list of, you know, these non-negotiable standards that we kind of all have in common in our local area. We, we really want to be a part of that. And then the study year for English language arts is also beginning in 21-22. Um, we included for you a few links for different curriculum resources. I know these are resources that some of you are already aware of, but just um, some publications that might help guide our work. The idea would be a proposed timeline that we would like to work to establish a task force um, yet this summer. And the task force to Eileen's question would be representative of members of PSC and members throughout the district. We would work to make sure that all uh, grade levels, disciplines, uh, there's a wide variety of representation of both teachers and administrators. Uh, we would like to bring that group together, review the initial charge and scope of work and, and get them sort of kicked off on their work. Um, in the fall, we believe that surveying our students staff, our parents, and our community members is a critical piece to inform this work. We already have planned to continue our professional development with Dr. Marks, um, and we would envision that the task force would continue meeting. Um, Dr. Marks will be meeting with our secondary staff on October 15th. Yep. Um, and then if you see in the spring, he has um, a scheduled professional development with our elementary staff in uh, February. So that's work that's already um, planned and, and we'll move forward. Um, we would envision that the task force would continue meeting with the idea of bringing an update to the board um, in either May or June of next year. Um, and I don't think that, I think two big points. Um, first is that we wanna make sure that there's a, a clear understanding that this work to be done well will, will take time and so I'm not, I'm not meaning to say that by May or June the work will be done, but I think that within 
the school year, our group should be able to come back to the board to say, this is what we've accomplished and this is where we believe we need to go next. Um, so ideas, you know, um, the task force charged some ideas that we would ask them to look at in the investigation would be use of a school uh, scorecard tool uh, to evaluate um, our curriculum. So how is diversity addressed in our curriculum? Um, are our classroom libraries representative of diverse authors and characters? Are there a variety of perspectives represented in our curriculum? We, begin, we believe because of the timing with ELA and World Studies Task Force already up and running, those, those would be easy departments to partner with. Um, to evaluate the scorecard responses from our staff and from our community. Um, and then really to make some recommendations for what steps are next um, in this review process. Again, to do this well, um, the work won't be free. Um, and so that's something that we wanna make sure. We're just really putting budget, budget estimates together. Uh, we believe to bring this group together, it'll likely be a group of around 15 people. So that means that we will have to pay for either extended contract pay for summer work or sub coverage if they meet during the school year. Um, professional development, you know, we're not sure what else we, we might want to do with Dr. Marks. Um, right now, the professional development that he is bringing to our district is paid for through the Project Aware grant, but there is a chance that we may want to do more with Dr. Marks, and so um, we, we may need additional funds for that. And then ultimately, the recommendation could be that we need to purchase different curriculum um, and we don't know, obviously, what those expenses would be at this time. That was meant to be sort of just a summary overview of where we're thinking we'd like to take the next steps. We recognize that there are a wide variety of opinions, um, and we want to support our staff and our community in moving forward together. Um, and we feel like this is a mechanism that we have that's evaluated and continue to move our curriculum forward for the last several years. So we'd like to, under that same umbrella, continue working um, in that vein. So, I don't know if board members have questions for either Linda or I. Uh, first of all, do we, is there any way that um, the public can see what's being taught by Mr. Mark? Hey, Mark. I mean, can we see what, sure. I mean, is, is there an online of the, um, uh, things we, he's already given as we, well as we so could we certainly can link see what's being taught yeah we could certainly or link information being... he is an employee of Oakland ISD mm -hmm. and so there's quite a bit of information um, on I'd there. like to actually see one of his uh, meetings that he has that he okay and you have all that Sheila okay, but you're it saying is you'd in like... here hmm? where do I access it at yep, and so where there... can the public access it okay so there's a link If you scroll back, so um, I don't know what slide number this is, but the slide that I have pulled up here, Sheila, you see that there's a blue link in the middle, and that takes you to his agenda, to his programming, there's handouts, there all, there's all that there. And we can post that on our website. Okay, that's the first thing. The second thing is, are we uh, under the circumstances that there's concern about um, CRT being entered into. Are we having any plans to allow um, any parents to have any input? Mm -hmm. right. I remember I said that there would be surveys. We could... I mean, actually reading the material and mm -hmm. having some input mm -hmm. um, before it comes sure. to us. Sure. To that point, I, I know that we're looking at about a year from now for a final report, um, and I ask this with the understanding that this is totally a work in progress, but can we maybe establish some, some touch points throughout the year, throughout the process, so that we can see you know, where we are and how it's going? Can we get the occasional update? Yes, yeah, so every month, Linda provides an update on PSC to a, the board meeting, so she will include an update for this committee every month. Perfect. And so, and maybe I'll, I'll continue along the same lines. Um, how, how can the board help in this process or support the task force for this, um, for this project? 
And so you do have a board representative on yep. the task force through Dana. Um, you certainly would be invited to attend any professional development as I've tried to always do to make sure, um, it's especially easy when it was virtual, but to make sure that you're aware of the times and dates of professional development. Um, Linda, I don't know if there are other ways board members can support the task force process. Um, I mean, depending on if we organize, you know, more parent involvement or, you know, other outside entities on the, on the task forces, then that would be something we could mm -hmm. have Thank more you. involvement. Thank mm -hmm. you. I'd like to thank you. I'd like to thank you for putting this together. Um, mm -hmm. I know that you had to put this together really quickly. Yes. Um, and I know that it was largely in response to, you know, things we've heard from our community. Mm -hmm. So thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, same. I'd like to thank you guys. I know that's a lot of quick work. Um, I, I really like how um, extensive this, this project is. And I think considering what we've heard lately in our community, having something that's broader rather than really restricted to either one book, one concern, one department, I think is something that's really important. And so I actually like the fact that it's a long-term project, that we're not going to get answers in a month. And I think in a way, the the deeper process is gonna result in data that I think as a school district, we're gonna be able to use much more than something short term. Um, I love the fact that some of what you presented, um, I, or maybe that's the scientist in me, but when I see it, I see data. Like you said, you know, scorecard, um, something that we can look at a little bit more objectively, especially on something that's so sensitive having some data to make information on, and I, I'm, I'm hoping, I guess, next May or June, whenever that happens, that that's what we can look a little bit on, is the actual data of where we are, what are we doing, because in maybe in some areas we're doing more than we think, and maybe in others less than we think. Um, and then lastly, I'm, I'm not sure if in some of the professional developments that you envision, if we can make sure there's a follow-up in my professional experience, it's so easy to go to professional development and we get all pumped up and we leave, we're excited, but without a follow-up, it can be hard to feel supported in actually implementing some change or, and so I don't know if we can maybe build that up. And I, I know in the budget you have, you have quite a bit for, I think it says consulting. Mm -hmm. And so maybe that's what we mean here in the consulting is, is some of that not just a one-time event, but some of that follow-up. And I, I think that is very much Dr. Mark's model. Right. So we had the February PD um, in 2021, then there was follow-up with both secondary and elementary. Now we'll continue the follow-up um, with secondary and elementary. And I, I think the idea would be to bring our task force together and let those folks determine what consulting, what support, what we might right. need. Yeah, that, that makes sense, thank you. I'm impressed with um, how well this is aligning to the mission and the vision of the district. So not that many years ago, our community got together and made some statements, some overreaching statements of what we want our community to be about, especially with this culturally competent area. There was a lot of conversation and there were some very specific goals set in our plan. And this is aligning to that. So it was nice hearing from PSC that their PSC work has actually been integrating those goals in the individual works with each of the curricular items as they're rolling through our plan that we have, our multi-year plan. Um, and so I think this aligns very, very well with what the community had spoken they wanted when we did our goals, setting and mission and vision, and the work that we're trying to do. So I think it's a very nice way not to have something completely out of left field, but something discontinuing and building on the work that we've learning how to do and getting better at doing that is directly tied to what the community had asked us to do when we created that. So thank you. Thank you. I only have one, one follow-up question. Um, do we envision the task force to be thinking about what kind of other experts, maybe local experts, we can tap into? Is that kind of the thought process? Is that's the group of people that might determine who to reach out besides Dr. Marks? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely think that's part of the discussion. Um, since we already have our relationship with Dr. Mark, we wanted to continue that. He's coming back in October, but we recognize that we do have some you know, local experts. Um, when I reached out to, our, to the RESD to see what the plan was for this next year, she also mentioned that she didn't say a name, but she said she's got two consultants as well that are experts in this field to help okay. guide the 
roll out. I think one of the things the task force will also be able to do is look at districts across the state. Mm -hmm. right? the, this is a um, common topic of interest for many communities in our state right now. And so to be able to learn from what other districts are doing it will be another important piece. Well, not only that, but it's a great model. In the future, other things could crop up, mm -hmm. right? And so we need a technique and a model to say, we have the curriculum, but how is it being applied? Are we doing it correctly? Are we doing it like we think we are? And that this, this is a good test for that and creating a model for that kind of deeper dive and making sure everything's linked as we think it should be. Thanks again for putting this together. Yep. We will continue to keep you updated as we move forward. So uh, the next item under my report is the Yo and Yo auditing services for 2122 Ginger. Yes, you have before you the annual um, engagement letter from our auditors, Yo and Yo, just kind of covering their scope of work for the upcoming audit. Um, it covers, uh, you know, not only the fact that they'll be auditing our financials and our federal programs, also our bond programs um, and our internal controls. This is, uh, like I said, just an annual letter. It's informative only. No action is needed by the board tonight, but just an engagement letter, a long one. Thank you, Ginger. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to provide a summer program update for you all. Um, I know uh, I had someone say to me, why did I see a Mount Pleasant Public Schools bus driving down the street yesterday? So just in case you're wondering, um, although balanced calendar programs did end last Thursday, we did also last week kick off our summer school programs. So our academic support programs are currently running at uh, Ganyard, Pullen, Vowles, Pancher, McGuire, and Mount Pleasant High School. Uh, we have just under 200 students enrolled in our K-5 programs. And we have uh, right around 82 students, I'm sorry, 85 students that are enrolled in credit recovery programs at Mount Pleasant High School. We do also have a Mount Pleasant Middle School summer school program, but that will not start again um, until uh, August. So there's a little bit of a break there. Um, so, but all those programs are utilizing our buses. In addition, our PEAK program is up and running full this year. So uh, PEAK is using buses for some of um, their field trips and their special programming and that kind of thing. We do have PEAK programs this summer at Vowels, Fancher, and Pullen. Um, we are also running our Meet Up and Eat Up program. That is our food distribution program. So we are distributing meals to all community members, age zero to 18, uh, once a week on Wednesdays. Families can pick up seven breakfasts and seven lunches for each child in their family. We do also provide free meals to any special education student up to age 26. So um, every other week at meal distribution, we will also be distributing nutrition club bags. That's a partnership that we continue with the Community Compassion Network. So this week is a week where we will have nutrition club bags. So uh, the only week where we are not doing our food distribution is during the week of July 5th. So that July 5th is a Monday, so I guess July 7th would be the Wednesday of that week. We won't have that uh, major food distribution. Because meals are still free and because we do still participate in the Meet Up and Eat Up program, we are able to provide meals to all the students that are coming to summer school as well as the PEAK program. So we have a, a very active, very busy kitchen this summer as uh, we're feeding students all over our community. So. Um, in addition to those programs, certainly we have our athletic um, open gyms, uh, training exercises, activities that are going on, and then also good old fashioned driver's training um, is happening right here at Mount Pleasant High School. So um, although we are quote unquote closed for the summer, um, it is really shaping up to be a very busy summer around the district. So you will likely see lots of movement and lots of vehicles from our fleet um, all around the community all summer. So. Any questions about summer programs? I, I do have a question. Um, I was wondering if we had on our website a place where if a parent wants to participate in some of these activities, and I'm particularly thinking of the athletic activities, uh, they can find that out. I know some of it is posted on, on like boards all over schools, mm -hmm. or but the online orders haven't seen those. Um, and so I'm not sure if, if we currently have that location, but it would be nice to have 
spots for elementary and middle and high school where as a parent I could say, hey, maybe my child is vaccinated now and can participate or I feel like it's okay now in X, Y, and Z sure. um, and find that information. I can, I can coordinate and put all the summer information together. I know we have the meet up, eat up information there. Um, and I believe the guidance for athletics is it's to contact way. the athletic department, but we can okay. try to bring that all together. Um, it, at some point, it will become sort of too late to sign up for mm -hmm. some of the academic supports, but to give folks a, a, a place to go, a, a landing spot, we can certainly do that on our website. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And that's all for my report this evening. Okay, thank you. Um, next is the requested financial report from Ginger. I have for you the um, financial reports for general fund and special service funds comparing for revenue and expenditures comparing budget to actual for the month ending May 2020 and the month ending May 2021. For general fund, revenues are at 71% of budget this year compared to 71% of budget last year. Expenditures are at 76% of budget this year compared to 75% last year, so we're still right on target with our spending from, from prior year. For special service funds, athletics, revenue is at 0% this year compared to 12% last year, and expenditures are at 30% this year compared to 81% last year. This is the self-sustaining sports, this is hockey and palm, um, and we, we do have revenue coming in to cover those expenditures yet this year. For the Children's Learning Center, revenue is at 95% of budget this year compared to 90% last year, and expenditures are at 75% of budget this year compared to 80% last year. For the nurse testing program, we'll never have revenues in this program again. Uh, we're spending down fund balance, so expenditure, expenditures are at 3% this year compared to 8% last year. For the food services, revenue is at 76% of budget this year compared to 77% last year, and expenditures are at 59% this year compared to 80% last year. And for the school store, revenue is at 37% of budget this year compared to 99% last year and expenditures are at 33% this year compared to 94% last year. For Treasurer's Report General Fund, um, on April 30th, we had a cash balance of $6.3 million. We had income in the amount of 3.2 million and disbursements in the amount of 3.7 million. That brings us a balance on May 31st of $5.7 million. For the Debt Retirement Fund, we had a beginning balance on April 30th of $568,000. Um, revenue in the amount of 29,000 and disbursements of 193,000. That brings us a balance on May 31st of $404,000. And for the Capital Projects Fund, we had a balance on April 30th of 2.8 million, a small amount of interest income, less than $100 there, and no disbursements for the month of April. That brings us a balance on May 31st of $2.8 million. Um, next is correspondence. Over the last month, we have had um, correspondence that has all been entered into your board packet. packet. Um, we have received that from Eric Chaircover, uh, Xantha Karp, uh, Harper Traumer Beardsley, Jennifer Shiza, Celie Bush, Bob Bush, Joshua Adams, Jennifer Drevin, uh, Diane Steyer, Tobin Dennis, Amanda Eden Garrison, Lisa Wiley, Kyan Gilsdorf, Alcentra, Amy Perchbacher and Nicole Hagel and Kelly Fountain. Um, next up is the consent agenda. Um, with the consent items, the first being the approval of the June 7th, 2021 regular meeting minutes. So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? And that unanimously passes. Next is the financial with the approval of the bills. Um, is that, um, that is in your board packet. Is there a motion to have that pass? So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? And that passes. Um, next is a roll call vote for the MHSAA 2021-2022 resolution, which we heard earlier today. Actually, and I think Mr. Conway has some additional information he'll share with us quickly. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, this is just the annual um, 
approval from the from the board that uh, you, you're aware of that for us to participate in the MHSA, there's certain rules, regulations that uh, it, we will continue to follow. So this is an annual, um, hopefully yes vote that uh, we're alerting the MHSA that that our school board and school district is very aware of the do's and don'ts of athletics. Thank you. Is there a motion for the MHSAA 2021-2022 resolution? So moved. So moved. Seconded. Thank you. Um, this is a roll call vote, so Courtney? Dana Falcon? Yes. Tim Odekirk? Yes. Jessica Jernigan? Yes. Sheila Murphy? Yes. Courtney Stegman? Yes. William Pengel? Yes. Amy Bond? Yes. That unanimously passes. Next is the donations. You have two different donations in your board packet this evening. The first one is from Staples. Staples has donated 204 care packages that have hand sanitizer and tissues um, to the value of $1,020. That will be distributed throughout the district. We also have a donation, an anonymous donation of $3,000 uh, to be used by the staff and students at Ganyard Elementary. And we're asking that you accept those donations this evening. Is there a motion to accept the donations from Staples and the anonymous donation to Ganyard Elementary School? So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? And that passes. Um, with much thanks. Um, mm -hmm. GRBS, um, the contract mm -hmm. extension? You have a memo in your board packet this evening um, asking to extend the Mount Pleasant Public Schools contract with Grand Rapids Building Services. We are asking for a one-year extension. Uh, the increase in the contract is due to their proposed increase in wages for their employees. As I'm sure you've seen throughout the community, uh, wages are going significantly higher and they do believe that they need to increase their wages um, in order to be able to, to meet the needs of their employees. So we're asking that you approve this contract extension for one year through June 30th of 2022. Is there a motion to accept that contract? So moved. Second. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? And that passes. Next is resignations. Good evening. Um, I would like to ask the board to accept the resignations of Matthew Haupt, Abigail Lewandowski, and Madeline Rybant. Is there um, a motion to accept the resignations of Matthew Haupt, Ab Abigail Ladowski, and Madeline Rybant? So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? and we accept those resignations and wish best of luck on future endeavors. Um, next is new hires. Yes, we are excited to bring on board the following candidates. Caitlin Bellinger at Fancher, or I'm sorry, McGuire Elementary, Alicia Dorsey for Fancher Elementary, Samantha Royce at MPMS, and Ashton Wargo at MPMS. Is there a motion to approve the new hires? So moved. Seconded. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? And we welcome those individuals to the district. Thank you. Um, next is the June amended budget resolution. Yes, I have for you the June budget revision proposal. Um, this is general fund excluding tribal grants. In December, the budget um, was projected to contribute back into fund balance $461,447. Uh, we made a bunch of different adjustments and I'll kind of run through them quickly so you can see how we get to the, the new proposed bottom line. We adjusted some tax revenue um, from December to June, the taxable value changes. So we adjusted that to match what our state aid um, reports as well. We There's some miscellaneous revenue adjustments um, like facility rentals, uh, transportation revenue, that type of thing that we adjusted. Uh, state aid, the biggest part of that was a section 147 MIPSERS increase um, for over what we had proposed for in December. And then transfers in from other funds. So some other funds like the Children's Learning Center Fund, um, the Food Service Fund, and 
the there's one more that uh, the self-sustaining sports if they use our internal transportation um, we sometimes have internal um, movement between those funds so that changed a little bit um, we also updated the expenses for Oasis Way that changes twice annually based on student count the fees that we owe that program so we adjusted that the ELL consortium was um, discussed actually last year when we proposed um, changes in that program this is us joining a consortium so that was added into the budget salaries and benefits this is um, all of the movement and changes that have happened between December and now people leaving people coming in insurance changes this was the one and a half percent that was given um, after the December budget revision was accepted so um, that came to uh, increased expenditures four hundred ninety one thousand dollars you see on there pre CTE um, there was a pre CTE is not a um, bottom line neutral program like the regular G GI tech program this there was a teacher overload that um, was budgeted too high so that in the retirement like a workers comp was the majority of this adjustment here and then some more miscellaneous like um, printing utilities unemployment dual enrollment just a bunch of different miscellaneous expenditures throughout the district that were adjusted came into that twenty six thousand dollar line so that brings us to a bottom line of it projected to contribute back to fund balance still three hundred and forty four thousand dollars this is a really great number typically we don't spend 100 percent of our budget and i anticipate that being again this year so this number hopefully will be higher than the three hundred forty four thousand so um, thankful for all of the different grants that we've received this year to help pay for a bunch of different you know COVID expenditures and things like that it really helped out um, so the last slide or the next slide here just shows you total revenue of 48.3 million total expenditures of 48 million so that brings us to that expected to contribute back three hundred forty four thousand four hundred sixty three dollars and looking at that as an expenditure uh, or as a percentage of our total expenditures that's a 12.28 percent fund balance so right in the target um, area kind of I, and I expect that to be higher too so um, I'm pleased this was a, a lot of work a lot of software issues but we worked through it all so um, ending up with this this bottom number after the year that we've had I think is is really good thank you I we heard about those software issues so <laughs> <laughs> we're happy that they came through for you um, is there a motion to accept the return of that money in the fund balance I have one question ginger do these numbers include um, the summer school programs or is that going to be in next partial yes so we are re receiving two grants for the summer school program we've we've already had one hit our state aid so that is budgeted in here um, we haven't had the next one hit yet so that will be budgeted in new year um, it's it's bottom line neutral because we'll it's a grant so is whatever we spend we will be getting in in revenue okay thank you you're welcome there a motion so moved except the amended budget for June second and I believe this is a roll call vote um, so Courtney Dana Cocken yes Tim Odekirk yes Jessica Jernigan yes Sheila Murphy yes Courtney Stegman yes William Pengel yes Amy Bond yes um, next is the 2021-2022 fiscal year budget yeah, so continuing right along you have another um, PowerPoint presentation there slide presentation for new year budget you see that June projected to contribute back the number right at the very top that we just talked about 344,000 to the good um, we increased the foundation allowance by 164 dollars per pupil as we discussed here I, I really think that might be low nothing still has yet been signed into law so we we have no idea what that number is going to be but um, based on how positive the May consensus revenue estimating conference report was we expect it to be higher than this we're hoping it to be higher than this but we like to be conservative so we went with the hundred and sixty four dollar that was originally suggested that um, we use that's an increase in revenue of five hundred and seventy four thousand dollars now with that I also had to change us back from the super blend so this year we were allowed to use a super blend for our student count which was 75% of the blended count from 1920 and 25% of the blended count from 2021 that really benefited us this year 
um, with being down so many students, that really helped us not lose so much money. Next year, that goes away. So we're, we go back to 90% of the fall count and 10% of the previous spring count. That is a reduction in revenue of $477,000, going changing um, back to the normal way we do our blended count. Um, I also restored the 20% building budget cuts that happened in 2021. Those were never restored, and it's really hard um, for buildings to just get teaching supplies for their classrooms with that with that reduction. So we, we re did restore that moving forward, and then a bunch of uh, different miscellaneous adjustments netted to $971. So the running total there is still contributing back 347,000. You just approved the GRBS contract increase that was an additional expense of $108,000 as they want to give their staff a raise um, that obviously has to flow through to us also. And then the biggest adjustment is the salary and benefit changes. So um, I adjusted the hard cap. We know what it will be starting January 2022. So I adjusted that prorated amount for um, how much we're allowed to pay for health insurance for our employees. I adjusted, I increased the retirement percentage. We know it was, um, the district has to pay 40, in 2021 it was 42.72% that we pay on every dollar for salaries into retirement. Moving forward the next year it's 43.28%. So we increased that. Uh, we rolled everyone up a step. We do this every year for budgeting purposes um, to make sure that we're covering those increases that happen throughout the year. So when all those changes are said and done, we're looking, we're looking at projected to spend into fund balance $101,000. I think this will get better as we hear what our foundation allowance increase will be, um, but also the, the big unknown is what our student count will look like next fall. That's really hard to predict. We predicted flat since we predicted a lower foundation allowance increase. So um, it'll be interesting to see what happens as we move forward, but um, I'm pretty comfortable with this this number here because I, I really do think it will get better as we move forward. So that looks that um, looks like a total revenue of 47.1 million dollars, total expenditures of 47.2. This is lower than the total you saw in the June amendment we just approved because a lot of our federal grants went away, so revenue and expenditures went away. Um, projected to spend into fund balance 101,829 dollars which is a 12.26% of our total expenditure for our fund balance, which is still a fairly decent number. Are there any questions for Ginger? Is there a motion to pass the 2021-2022 fiscal year budget? So moved. Second. And this is a roll call vote as well. Anna Crocken? Yes. Kim Odekirk? Yes. Jessica Jernigan? Yes. Sheila Murphy? Yes. Courtney Stegman? Yes. William Tangle? Yes. Amy Bond? Yes. And then thank unanimously you. passes. Ginger, thank you for battling our software system and all of the work that you've had to do. It will get better as we move forward. And it's hard to, we're still in two different systems. Our payroll's still running out of the old one. So um, it was a challenge, but it will get better. It will get smoother, I promise. <laughs> thank you very You're much. Welcome. Next is the Mount Pleasant Education Association tentative agreement ratification. In your board packets this evening, you have the uh, ratification agreement uh, from the Mount Pleasant Education Association. This is the Teachers Association. Um, this is a one-year agreement, um, and we've specified the areas of adjustment to their master agreement, uh, which we discussed in closed session a couple of weeks ago. So uh, we're asking that you approve this tentative agreement this evening. Any questions? Is there a motion to pass the tentative agreement from the teachers union? So moved. Seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? And that unanimously passes. Next is the administrator association. So the next um, MO that you have is a tentative agreement with the Mount Pleasant Administrator Association. Um, this is a two year agreement. Um, largely because they're kind to us and let us uh, juggle so we don't have every contract up every year. So uh, just a few adjustments within their um, agreement and they are not represented by MEA. They are our only group that represents themselves. 
um, but we're asking that you approve this ratification for a two-year master agreement <laughs> with the Mount Pleasant Administrators Association. Any questions? I, I do have a question. So the only change is, is what's crossed out, right? Is that how I'm reading this? I believe you're looking at, that to me looks like the Mount Pleasant, that's the Teachers Association. Oh, so I need to go to the next one. I'm sorry. Yeah. So if you scroll down, yep, so oh, yeah. you'll see the highlights in yellow okay. there. And so if it's not highlighted, it's the same. Correct. So, okay. Correct. Thank you. And we've only pulled out the sections of their master agreement that have any changes okay. in it. That makes sense. Is there a motion to pass the administrator association agreement? So moved. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And that unanimously passes. Next is the transportation agreement. Yeah, our bargaining teams have been busy. Um, the last uh, memo is for the Mount Pleasant Transportation Association. And we are asking at this point just for a 60-day extension of that master agreement. It's certainly, currently set to expire on June 30, and we would ask for your approval of extending that through August 31st so that we can continue to meet and negotiate the master agreement this summer. So we'll believe, we believe that we'll be able to come back to you with um, more of a bargain contract by the end of the summer. Are there any questions? Is there a motion to pass the um, extension of the contract? So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, and that unanimously <clears throat> passes as well. Next, we come to public comment. As we have in weeks past, I will um, go ahead and read the name. Um, you have time to come up um, to address the board. Please state your name and where you reside in. Um, and Mr. Odekirk will let you know um, when your time is up. Um, for those that might be new to attending, this is not a time that the board will respond to answers. Um, this is a time for uh, you as individuals to address the board for public comment. Um, net, or first up is Pat uh, Berge. Good evening. My name is Patrick Berge. I'm born and raised in Mount Pleasant with children in both public school and Sacred Heart Academy. I want to commend the board for your patience and professionalism as you've been both praised and berated by people from not only this community but all over the nation the past couple of months. I am both encouraged and deeply troubled, but yet deeply troubled by the June 7th meeting where there was a robust discussion on CRT. Encouraged because I believe there's a movement by regular people to get more involved with their children's education troubled by the what appears to be a non-transparent and misleading manner where CRT is currently being inserted into the public education curriculum. First, I want to unequivocally state that I love my country. I served in the military for 25 years with three deployments covering 32 months in distant lands where we defended and befriended people of different color, nationality, and religion. I've seen death and destruction up close and witnessed the oppression of a populace by an evil ideology. I'm also named after my dad's best friend, a 19-year-old Beale City boy who died in a rice paddy in 1968 fighting communism in Vietnam. Never in my wildest dreams would I ever believe that I would be in a position up here opposing the roots of communism being introduced in a positive light to school kids here in Mount Pleasant, Michigan. There were 30 individuals at the last meeting who spoke on CRT, 19 in favor, 11 opposed. But of the 19 supporting CRT, many were misleading and they were educators. The description of CRT is teaching critical thinking or true history. Then I saw some bullet comments tonight where it also says teaching critical thinking. The scheme of words is false and deceptive and only one speaker last week correctly stated that CRT is rooted in Marxism. And if you want proof, look no further than the book Stamped, a book currently being taught in English in classes in Mount Pleasant High School, as well as um, talked about the last meeting by several people at, up here. I read this book and was shocked that it is actually being taught in our schools. 
Phil Kruska will provide a more detailed analysis following my comments. But the truth is, CRT is already starting to accomplish what Marxism, fascism, communism all have in common, which is to divide us, to eventually get us to hate each other. And this is probably the saddest aspect of CRT. We can teach the history of slavery and racism in the United States without attacking the foundations and values of American principles. And we should also teach the history of slavery in the world, as there is currently many countries and cultures where it exists today, which is very sad. Just stick to the facts and keep political agendas out of the classroom. We are all in this together, so there needs to be more transparency about the depth of CRT currently in our curriculum. I would request that the curriculum, the syllabus, required reading, suggested reading, be made public for all the public to be able to see what is being taught to our children. I am here as a proud American who loves my country. I'm an ally to all. I willingly sacrificed 25 years of my life so that all of you have the freedoms and liberties and opportunities no other country in the world has. I have had your three minutes. But Please most of all, as a father who wants my children and grandchildren to have all the liberties that I've been blessed with as an American. Thank you. Next is Phil Kruska. My name is Phil Kruska and I'm a resident of Mount Pleasant. Uh, Pat Berge wrote this uh, that I'm going to read and I agree with what he has written. Last meeting, Carlene Borsheen Black, a professor at CMU with children in Mount Pleasant, stated regarding CRT that there was no connection to Marxism and never has been, and suggested opponents should seek out what is actually being taught and that the link to Marxism is a dog whistle. Well, we did, and the book Stamped is currently be used, being used in high school English and was praised by Hannah Hamlin last meeting that her daughter had read it. The author is Ibram X. Kendi, also the author of How to Be an Anti-Racist. One of the predominant and celebrated characters in this book is Angela Davis, a Marxist and longtime member of the Communist Party USA from 1969 to 1991. She was twice the party candidate for vice president and is a recipient of the Lenin Peace Prize. And yes, that prize is in, in honor of Vladimir Lenin of the former Soviet Union. She formally left the CP USA in 1991 but currently acknowledges to have a relationship with the Communist Party. The book Stamped dedicates 28 pages to Angela Davis in a positive and celebratory light. By contrast, there are 20 pages dedicated to Thomas Jefferson, most if not all negative, and the only 10 pages to Abraham Lincoln where his efforts to end slavery are minimized and qualified by the author. The final mention of Angela Davis is on page 247 in the closing pages of the book, where in this progression of names starts with Cotton Mather, a late 1600 Puritan who the author credits with sowing the seeds of white, white supremacy, then to Thomas Jefferson, author of the Declaration of Independence in 1776. Then to William Lloyd Garrison, a white abolitionist in the 1800s. Next is W.E.B. Du Bois, a civil rights leader in the early 1900s. The final name in this progression is Angela Davis, where her name is repeat, repeated three times for emphasis, as if she is who she, we should aspire to be. Please tell me how this is not a connection to Marxism. Abraham Lincoln, the president who saved the Union, and issued the Emancipation Proclamation, or Martin Luther King, who led the Civil Rights Movement, which resulted in the 1964 Civil Rights Act and 1965 Voting Rights Act, are excluded from this progression of names. There needs to be full transparency of the current curriculum and its content so our public knows what our taxpayer dollars are funding. This is unacceptable for our children to be taught an ideology that history and time has proven to be oppressive and anti-American. Thank you. Next is Stacy Pratt.
Good evening, my name is Stacy Pratt, I'm from Mount Pleasant, Michigan. Two college professors at the last meeting in support, there were two college professors at the last meeting in support of CRT, but also supported the, stated their support of the 1619 project, with one CMU professor stating specifically that America was founded in white supremacy. This is flat out wrong and historians have debunked this narrative by the 1619 authors and proponents. In fact, black America is one of the greatest success stories of all time. If you don't believe me, then believe Walter Williams, author of Race and Economics, professor of economics at George Mason University, as well as being African American. He states in his book, black Americans compared with any other racial group have come the greatest distance over the sum of the highest hurdles in a shorter period of time. You see, of the estimated 12 million captured and boarded on ships, 1.5 million tragically perished at sea. Of the remaining 10.5 million, only an estimated 3 to 4 percent came to the United States, between 350 and 400,000. The other 10 million went to South America and the Caribbean, with over 4 million alone going to Brazil. Fast forward to 2007, the year Race and Economics was published, Black America had a population of 40 million with a po combined per capita GDP of 726 billion. This ranked Black America alone as the 18th largest county in the world by GDP. This is one of the several analyses Dr. Williams uses to illustrate the success of Black America. When updated with the latest World Bank data, the current Black America population of 42 million they actually increase in rank to 17. Their success is precisely due to the foundation set in our founding documents, particularly in the Constitution and all its amendments. Just as important as our founding documents are is our free markets, where, this, where the means of production and its profits are based on private ownership, not state-controlled central planning. There is no other country, especially in those in those countries where the other 97% of slaves were sent, where this kind of opportunity and freedom exists. Yes, our country has made mistakes. Yes, our founding fathers were imperfect men. Yes, the US, just like every other country in the world, has battled with bigotry and racism, but black America is a story of how freedom and liberty leads to victory that absent our founding father's courage and wisdom would not have been possible any other, under any other form of government. The 1619 Project does not reflect the greatness of our country nor the greatness of black America. Thank you. Terry Kunst. Good evening. My name is Terry Kunst. I'm a 22-year resident of Mount Pleasant and have four children, all who became mine through adoption. The first being my wife's son, whose dad was killed in a car accident and lost his father. And three multiracial children, all have attended this school system. I currently have four grandchildren, all multiracial, black, native, and Asian. I'm also a Vietnam veteran and a Gold Star family, uh, family member. For those who are not aware of what a Gold Star uh, family is, is someone who's lost a family member in battle. My brother Gene was killed in Vietnam in 1968. I listened to the June 7th meeting and have serious concerns of the direction of our education, as many have said already. We need to have these curriculum and other detailed uh, contents disclosed publicly I too read the book Stamped and agree that it plants the seeds of Marxism, in my opinion. I believe we all understand this quote by Abraham Lincoln. It said, the philosophy of the schoolroom in one generation will be the philosophy of government in the next. I was disappointed to see one of Mount Pleasant Public School employees address the board wearing a Black Lives Matter t-shirt. 
This leaves no doubt in my mind that there's a political agenda has entered the classrooms already. In fact, Black BLM was founded by three self-professed Marxists, and one of their stated beliefs is that they, quote, disrupt the Western prescribed nuclear family structure requirement by supporting each other as extended families and villages that collectively care for one another, especially our children, to the degree that mothers, parents, and children are comfortable, unquote. I can read that several times. It really doesn't make much sense to me other than I think they're trying to tear away, tear down the family unit. And I'm sure the school district understands the importance of healthy family units in this district. Our country is by no means perfect. There is no perfect person. The only one that there was was killed. But show me one that is. Neither history or English should be taught with a political agenda. There are countless examples through history where this has occurred and failed. As a taxpayer, but most of all as a proud American veteran, I do not want material that supports or just encourages the failed ideologies in the classroom. Marxism, Stalinism, Nazism, uh, communism. Those are not th values that the, the American people hold. The board, the schools, and the public need to work together to ensure our children are getting a balanced education where they are not being used as tools of any political agenda. From Anthony Davis and James Hargan, this quote, the sad truth is too, excuse me, the sad truth is too many Americans find freedom so uncomfortable and frightening that they welcome authoritarianism, excuse me, our argument is over You've which had your three kind minutes. Could you do please we wrap want. Up your comments? The leftist value variant, which culminates in Stasi style, uh, snitch state, or the strongman version of which every decision is made from on high. And I say neither one. Let us remember that over one million of our heroes gave their lives, men and women, for the freedom we enjoy today. And as Abraham Lincoln said in 1862, America is the last best hope on earth. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Kelly Fountain. Hi, I'm Kelly Fountain. Um, I was interested in what the plan is for next year's um, school year for um, mask wearing and all the other precautions. I know the governor has lifted the mask mandates and precautions at this time. So are you going to be requiring a vaccination for staff and students to be enrolled into the next year? Or we need to know what we need to do for next year. Um, I know there is a waiver, a non-medical waiver for students to for the parents to sign for their vac for, for them to not have vaccination to attend school at this point. So can the students still opt out at this point if they get the vac or the um, waiver? I'm not sure. We'll have to find that out. Example like for religious reasons or some other reason. Um, this form is at the local health department and vaccines are a recommendation and not law at this point. So, and I've also noticed the board members, some of them have masks and some don't. Are you all on the honor system or did the other members show you their vaccine passports for them to take their masks off? With that, the same honor system should be implemented for the children next year and the staff going forward for next year. There isn't data at this, there's data at this time that we know that students are not as um, at risk as we thought last year. So, um, and at this point, 70% of the teachers and staff has been vaccinated, so their threat and the risk is low at this point. So it should be a choice for parents to choose not to, and not, not to be forced by the government mandate or by the school. Or, and a lot of other states are open right now and have no mandates, have nothing right now. So I'm not sure why our state is still doing it. 
Um, and I was wondering, for all the events and sports, are you only going to play sports that are only uh, vaxxed and tested players? Or, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the schools have dropped all their mandates and things. Um, are you gonna still going to be able to play against them, or are you going to require them to have uh, vaccinations and testing before you play them? Um, that's a concern. And um, that's all I have. Thanks. Thank you. Next is Bree Mogenberg. Brian Mogenberg, Mount Pleasant. What is indoctrination? To ingrain and saturate a certain quality, point of view, or principle, usually partisan or biased, a discriminating opinion. So how does this happen? I ran into an article that explains how 97% of English teachers are Democrats and 3% are Republican, how 87% of math and science teachers are Democrat and 13% are Republicans. Do you see a problem here? a bipartisan board, but it's not bipartisan. So much so that I personally know conservative teachers that won't speak up because they're fearful of their job. Citizens and parents that wouldn't even speak here tonight, no matter how many times I asked them, because they're fearful, they're going to be called a racist. Take a second and notice the shirt that I chose. I feel this point was necessary. How would you feel if I were a teacher wearing this as I represent my school and I teach? I know last board meeting, there was a teacher present that wore a BLM shirt. Imagine if I taught class with a mask that says, I am heterosexual. I will admit after the last meeting, I was actually pressured to join the trend. My mask didn't arrive in time. Peer pressure is a real thing, and your policies and procedures speak on preventing it with our students, and yet staff are not only engaging in it, but promoting it to students. Students are pressured when you and teachers promote such beliefs as BLM, a political movement that supports to defund the police, LGBT, a movement that promotes and normalizes sexual expression, BLM, a move, I'm sorry, hold on here, which is not appropriate in school. Critical race theory, propaganda that promotes Marxism. All of these are liberal ideas. You are crossing a line that not only violates constitutional rights, but also the rights of the students that you speak of in your policies. Students have a right to feel comfortable, and they aren't comfortable when the school is promoting sex. In case you're not aware, sexuality by definition is the quality or state of being sexual. Let me say that again. Sexuality is the quality or state of being sexual. It is perverted to share your sexual interests or supports with students. Sex ed is the place for it, and for a child to participate in sexual education, they need parent permission. Parent permission. When my seventh grader comes home and is uncomfortable because she has to discuss sex, in English language arts class, this is problematic, period. We have principles in the curriculum to support abstinence. It is expected that teachers should not be promoting political statements, they should not discriminate, and they should not promote sexuality. Let me be clear, if you support abstinence, children do not need to know your sexual preference, and neither do I. You've had three minutes, please wrap up. I'm almost done, thank you. Teaching our children to think critically does not mean that teachers raise and promote critical issues with them, and surely not sex, and especially not ones that even adults have disparities with. Our schools in June of last year made a political, a political statement, and in that statement, they had said black lives do matter. That is not a statement that needs to be made unless that is made in a political science class. And if that is made in a political science Please class, I'm almost comment. done, Tim, thank you. If that is made in a political science class, you better end it by saying, make America great again.
passed. That will not be tolerated, and your board says it. Next is Shannon Adams. Shannon Adams. You're tough to follow, P. <laughs> my name is Shannon Adams, and I'm from Mount Pleasant, Michigan. Uh, my son will be a senior this year at Mount Pleasant High School. Over the past year and a half, he has spent more time sleeping, closed up in his room, and alienated from friends than a teenager ever should. His GPA has declined. He's seen less value in education than he once did. He and all other children have missed out on so much, but finally things seem to be getting back to somewhat of a new normal for all of us. He's also an athlete that's been subjected to weekly invasive COVID testing against my better judgment, but what choice did we have? If he did not test or get vaccinated, he would not be allowed to play. How could I take more from him? Um, he is a kid who has a low rate of becoming ill from COVID. There's no reason for him to be subjected to continued treatment and harassment. I'm aware of the new MDHHS My Safe Schools recommendations that are out so far for this fall. I can assure you that my son will not take the vaccine and I refuse to subject him to rapid testing each week. You all have agreed that it's important to teach critical race theory to our children. However, your actions and decisions, if you support this, will actually segregate and divide our children, sorting them by vaccinated and unvaccinated, complete with different rules and standards for each group. Have you taken the time to consider the harm this might do to our school district, to our kids, to their social standings? You're just giving them ammunition and another reason to pick on and bully one another. And why? Most things are returning to normal, yet MDHHS wants to continue to subject our kids to this treatment. How, how can you support this or why would you? Maybe for financial gains, maybe there's a few teachers that are afraid, but if they've been vaccinated, they should be protected. So why force this on others? The community elected you to sit where you are to make decisions that impact our children in very sensitive ways and areas of their lives. I understand that they are very hard decisions. Please protect our kids from continued harassment, segregation, and disruption in their daily school lives. Don't allow different rules and treatment for each group of kids. We need to keep in mind that this is an experimental drug and not everyone is comfortable taking it. We do not know the long-term effects on kids and young adults, and I refuse to force my child to take something he's not comfortable doing so. I also refuse to have him tested weekly. At what point did the state and the public school system begin to have more power over medical decisions for my child than me? At what point did I become incompetent in monitoring and managing his wellness? Additionally, there are many kids that are not vaccinated against a multitude of other viruses and illnesses. In 2016, 5% of kids who attended public schools in Michigan were unvaccinated. More recent reports predict the number is much higher in 2021. Will these children be subjected to twice weekly testing for pertussis, measles, mumps, polio? Why not? There are serious diseases as well. I'm told we can exempt our kids from certain vaccinations. So what steps do I take to make this happen for COVID vaccination and testing that I do not consent to for my minor child? It's time to take a stand. <clears throat> Please consider the psychological damage you would allow to occur to our children if you support this going forward. I understand the minutes. decisions in the beginning comments. and do not fault you. We did not know what we were dealing with. You thought you were protecting the teachers and the kids, but we know more now. We know the kids are very safe and suffer minimal symptoms with COVID in a vast majority of cases. Before making the decisions, consider the facts and take a stand for our kids. In a world where everything is opening up and getting Please back to up normal, your comments. Um, you would, why would you consider continuing the testing? The pandemic is over. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Paul Kruska. Hello, Paul Kruska from Shepherd. I lived in Mount Pleasant for 30 years previously 
and I had two sons that went through um, Mount Pleasant Public Schools from young fives through senior. I'm reading tonight a, a letter from a Karen Bedenai, who is a New Mexico resident, and it has to do with the CRT, critical race theory. I am a grassroots American, Native American, Navajo Indian conservative woman that is running for governor in my state in 2022. I believe in our republic and our constitution. I also have thoughts on critical race theory. I actually do know what it is deeply. I also know that I never want someone else to interject their outside voice into my cultural history, especially to my children. In support of CRT, if you support CRT from the propaganda side, you should definitely never question me nor battle me for Native American Indians have endured so much and know so much about the history that inflicted us, and you should vote for me directly without cause, without merit, nor research, just because of my race. If you support CRT, you'd stop your questioning me and treat me like a permanent victim and give me everything you have because the land you walked upon was stolen and must be returned and paid for with interest. So leave New Mexico. If you support CRT, reparations, reparations, reparations. If you support CRT, label and pigeonhole the darker the skin. If you support CRT, see and judge every person's race and color first and foremost. Common sense against CRT, civility. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We allow Americans to treat people as Americans. Justice is blind. The American dream is blind. Hope, love, and charity as we grow no matter where we came from. Therefore, as an American, it is my right to run for office. Office is not an entitlement to me because of my race. I have to work hard for it. Our republic is blind in our documents. Freedom is blind in our American dreams. Leave our culture history to us and let us heal without reopening wounds in new generations. My children will not care about their scars. They are clean and will walk forward as strong Americans. Thank you. Next is Bob Bush. I, for one, would like to thank CRT for enabling you know, continued education and research and study by a lot, all, all sorts of people in our community that they are looking into this so deeply and re-educating themselves on that. But I, for one, want to say that I am fully in support of this board and their committees and the staff in their culturally responsive curriculum review. And I hope that you guys find that there's more discussions that we can have on race and more discussion of the history of our great nation and that we're not just going to talk about the good things that happen. I mean, Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence, but he also you know, fathered children with slaves and all that intense. So we need to talk both of those things, absolutely. And there's all, and I believe if we do that, we will reach our mission statement and the mission statement being empower excellence. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next is Diane Kuntz. Good evening. My name is Diane Kunst, and I'm a 22-year resident of Mount Pleasant. We have four children and four grandchildren. All but two went to this school system. I'm also going to talk about the book Stamped. There is more. Another subtle example of promoting Marxism is on page 151 of the book, where the author states that one of the champions of civil rights 
was inspired by Karl Marx and broke ground on a new idea, anti-racist socialism. Google anti-racist, I'm sorry, Google anti-racist socialism and not much comes up. Not only does this book promote and glorify Marxism, it also omits or suppresses key information about significant events in history that leads the readers to believe white supremacists were the responsible <clears throat> parties. A prime example is how the book sets up the assassination of JFK. The author correctly states how JFK gave a landmark civil rights speech in June of 1963 that many segregationists at the time disagreed with. Then on page 171, the author discusses how Kennedy's approval numbers dropped after he launched an investigation into the September 1963 Birmingham, Alabama church bombing where four beautiful children were tragically killed. One page later, it discusses his trip to Dallas where he was trying to improve his polling numbers but never made it back to the White House, leaving the reader to believe that his assassination had to do with his civil rights speech and proposed policies. There's not one mention of Lee Harvey Oswald, the actual shooter who was a communist sympathizer and defected to the Soviet Union in 1959 and returned in 1962. On page 174, it mentions how when George Wallace ran for president in 1964, he allegedly received over 100,000 letters of support for his segregationist policies, mostly from the North. The author said it proved, quote, painfully that everyone, the North and the South, hated black people, unquote. Really, everyone? What about Andrew Goodman and Michael Schwerner, the two white New Yorkers killed, along with James Cheney by the KKK in 1964 when they were in Mississippi fighting for civil rights? Or what about the thousands of other white Northerners who participated in the 1964 Summer of Love, where white activists went into the Deep South and lived with black families to teach reading and register them to vote. You've had three minutes. Please wrap up your Thank comments. You. And the millions who supported them, or the thousands of Americans who would go to Vietnam fighting in the jungles and saving each other on a daily basis regardless of color. This book is riddled with distortions, omissions, and completely lacks objectivity, and I do not want our children taught these un-American ideologies. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Michael Heitman. Okay, thank you. Next is Kirsten Weber. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. My name is Kirsten Weber and I live here in Mount Pleasant and I have uh, three children in elementary school that are going through the district. And I'm also a professor at CMU and I teach critical race theory in some of my classes and I've also published several journal articles that utilize this theory. And I fully support having open discussions, particularly with children about this theory. Um, Tonight, I want to talk a little bit about my personal experience as a middle schooler when I was first introduced to this theory. And I also want to talk about um, my experience as a parent having these conversations with my very small children and also teaching young adults about this and other theories. When I was in sixth and seventh grade, I took an African American studies class for both years. And in that class, we talked a lot about um, histories, and we talked about slavery, we talked about the Jim Crow laws, um, we talked about 
redlining, I mean, all sorts of parts of our history that are really sad and really difficult. One of the comments that I've heard throughout this discussion over the past few weeks with the school board is that um, this might make children sad or make them feel guilty. And I wanna tell you that you're right. It might make them feel sad and it might make them feel guilty because I felt sad and I felt guilty about that. But I don't think that there's anything wrong with feeling sad or guilty about things that are actually wrong. What happened during that time period was problematic. And sadness tells us that there's a loss or that there's something that's difficult. And so having that reaction is a really natural reaction. And I think that it would be a really wonderful and really beautiful thing if we had teachers in this district who could have those conversations and teachers in this district who were trained to be able to talk about that sadness in a way that makes it okay to be sad. So, I think that that reaction is a good reaction to have. Second thing I wanna talk about is my personal experience as a parent and a professor who has open conversations both at my house and then also in the classroom about issues related to social justice, including racism and sexism and ableism and ageism and heterosexism and other forms of discrimination. And what I found both at home and in the classroom is that by and large, the two results that I see are that these kids, my kids, my kids in the classroom, they learn to be more empathetic. And I think that's a cornerstone of education is to listen to other people and try to understand them and try to feel what they're feeling. I mean, that makes us good humans. The second thing that I see is it does help with critical thinking. It helps people to see other ideas. You know, what I've heard tonight is people are really afraid of Marxism and socialism. And what I would say as a critical thinker is, ask yourself why. Why do those things make you really scared? If critical race theory is rooted in them, why are you afraid of them? And what does that really mean? I mean, that's what we want minutes. people Please to wrap do. Up your comments. Thank you very much. Um, so in conclusion, I would say there's a lot of benefits to talking about race and other forms of discrimination. And I think what we can hope for is a community that allows us to have those conversations and supports the empathy and the growth and the critical thinking that can come from those moments. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Carol Sabaski gall I'm Carol sobieski gall resident in this district for 40 years. My story is the same as many in my generation with alternate names and details. My grandparents were all part of the 60 million immigrants as young adults in the early 1900s. My grandfather served in the U.S. Armed Forces in World War I and became U.S. citizens upon honorable discharge from service. They raised their families in the Detroit area. My parents' generation spoke both Polish and English, which they learned in school. At home, they learned about their history, including the Holocaust, and experienced Polish culture, traditions, and ethnic foods, which they also shared with us. Their older brother served in World War II, defending what they called the old country. Imagine your own family members deployed in to defend your homeland overseas. My own father left high school to serve in Korea. He eventually became a tradesman, earning a journeyman's card. He raised his family in a tiny house in Metro Detroit. We remember the rioting in Detroit and the curfews that we were under. Our schools were part of the desegregation plan. Population surges were handled with split sessions in school buildings so there could be two different shifts of students and teachers daily. Our subdivision experienced boundary changes which caused me to attend three different junior high schools in four years and I never moved. Our school millage was not passed and all sports and extracurricular activities were canceled for my senior year. Because of all this, we learned to be flexible, resourceful, persistent, and united. I, I was happy when my own children, as students of Vowles Elementary, had multicultural experiences. Many of their classmates had parents that were international professors at CMU. Parents openly shared their own traditions, cultures, and yummy foods at classroom celebrations. My ch children also attended family and religious celebrations and events of their classmates. They received a quality education, a well-rounded cultural experience, and embraced the cultural variety of their friends, finding them fun and interesting. 
We don't have to teach tolerance if instead we generally, genuinely get to know one another, seeking to understand rather than to be understood. It was my grandfather's dream that his grandchildren would attend college even though his own children did not graduate from high school. He had high aspirations for us. A few of my generation did go to college, but most of us did not. My own children will be college graduates. It will be the third generation of American-born descendants that accomplished my grandpa's dream. He proudly handled my generation, handed my generation a baton which was representing his new country, the United States of America, a country that was growing, changing, developing, and steadfast, one of opportunity for education that offered hope for future generations. I question the representation of the baton that I'm handing to my own grandchildren. Are we going, doing the best that we can do to hand off a baton of value to this generation? It is our responsibility to empower them to succeed. Education is the key to this success, which is why we are here tonight with passion. We care about our kids and their future and the future of this great country that our own family members have sacrificed to defend, including my own son, who is presently active duty in the Air Force and heading to Turkey in November. What seeds are we planting? What will we be harvesting in years to come? We must be careful and intentional. Minutes. Please wrap up your comments. We must be careful and intentional in our decisions. Thank you. John Chiodini. Hi, I'm John Chiodini. Uh, lived here. I spoke to you last meeting. <clears throat> At the end of that meeting, it gave me um, a, t a pause, how emotional it was, and wow, it was really unique. <clears throat> but it had me thinking, I listened to the high school kids, and it had me thinking about my own experience uh, growing up. I was born and raised in Detroit, um, on the east side, grew up on the east side, um, went to parochial schools all my life. I put a tie on in kindergarten, I took it off when I was uh, graduated from high school. I had nuns teach me in elementary, I never, and I had all male teachers. I went to a Catholic all-boys school. Went to college, I majored in literature, and in 1968, I started teaching at Northwestern High School in Detroit. Uh, it's my hometown. That's where I wanted to be. And um, sh my first, I can never, I still remember my first day as a teacher. Walked into that classroom, and to my, I couldn't believe the fact that my students couldn't read. So, I. Um, at the end of the school year, I enrolled uh, back at Wayne State and got a master's in reading. And for the next decade, I've taught remedial reading in Detroit Public Schools. I taught remedial reading in Greenville Public Schools. And I taught remedial reading and was the reading consultant at Elmo Public Schools when I got pink slipped. Even though I taught 13 years, only been in Elmo for two. Um, total refined removed. And so there are about 20, some of us got pink slipped. I changed careers, all that while I've coached. When I was back in Detroit, <clears throat> I was blessed uh, to have a first-year teacher, whose name was Richard Wright, not the author, who had graduated from Tuskegee Institute. And we became close friends. And he would ask me if I had read th this book or that book by Richard Wright or Ralph Ellison. And I'm like, no, who are they? Okay. And all of a sudden, I read, started reading black literature, and I got turned on to the Harlem Renaissance, and, 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 and. And then I thought, you know what? My students, who are black, every child in that school was black, couldn't read those same books. And then as I got older, you know, I thought, in fact, the other night I was thinking, um, you know how when I was in elementary school, the nuns would talk about manifest destiny like it was some kind of a religious experience. And we all know it's not a religious experience. Okay. But what did I do? Well, I picked up a couple books. Okay. Uh, Empire of the Summer Moon. I encourage you to read that. Uh, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee. If you can get through that book, I tried to reread it and I can't. It's too emotional. I learned about the truth about what's going on or what went on with Native Americans. All of you know how to read. And we give a lot of lip service to um, being critical. 
If you are able to be critical, and the only way you're able to be critical is be able to have knowledge. You've had and your three minutes. Please reading. wrap up your comments. I will do that right now, sir. I looked at the aggregate local assessment, Mount Pleasant, SAT total, percent of students that meet or exceed benchmark. High school, 15 to 16 school year, 45.9. 16, 17, 40.4, 17, 18, 40.8. Please wrap up your comments. Okay, and here's the last one. These are your goals. These are my goals. These are all of your goals. All students at Mount Pleasant High School will be proficient in reading according Please to state standards and grade level minutes, content. Man. All students at Mount Pleasant High School will be proficient in writing. All students at Mount Pleasant High School will be proficient in mathematics. All Stakeholders comments, at Mount Pleasant, here's my last comment. I want you, number one, and you've heard this word too many times tonight, I want you to be transparent, no surprises. Please wrap up your comments. Okay, and number two, I want you to tell me or, and everybody here how CRT helps us achieve those goals in English and Please math wrap up and your reading. Comments. Amen. Thank you. Next, Andrea McKean. Hi, I'm Andrea McKinney, Mount Pleasant. Uh, this meeting I want to offer my assistance for your understanding the use of the COVID test. As community, we don't want to place all the burden on you, the board members. We will help you gain knowledge, which is teamwork, but know that as an elected board member representing our community in charge of decision making to create a positive learning experience for our area families, it is imperative for you to be well informed and responsive to the wishes of parents. So I will help you by providing research on topics I bring up. This responsi responsibility then becomes yours to review. So half of your work is done for you. We know from the release of Anth Anthony Fauci's 5,000 emails, we are at war. It's not like any war before. We were biologically attacked with a bioweapon from an adversary country. Our school activities were regulated by COVID testing last year. This year poses as an even bigger threat to freedom. The discussion of unvaxxed children having to endure COVID testing is akin to wearing a star on your sleeve as a Jew in the World War II Germany. It is also a violation against the federal HIPAA laws. The PCR test was never designed to isolate a virus. It picks up fragments of virus, even if left over from a previous cold. There were no regulations about how to run the test in the labs until recently, which created thousands of false positives. The test swabs contain ethylene oxide. There is danger to using swabs close to the blood-brain barrier. If a country will release a bioweapon such as COVID-19, what will they put on their nose swabs and mask? Who makes the nose swabs and masks? I will email you information about the failures of the PCR test, which we are making decisions on. The income or the info comes from many sources, mostly doctors. Thank you in advance for your effort to become informed and to be true advocates for our community. Thank you. Maureen N.E.K. Good evening. Good evening, I'm Maureen N. Ake, and I live here in Mount Pleasant. I don't have a kid who has gone to school, any of these schools. I pay taxes that support this school. I teach at CMU, I'm faculty in English. I was here two weeks ago. I listened to a whole lot of things that people have said. I want to again commend the board for your patience and for your willingness to listen to us. So thank you very much. This has been a tremendously traumatizing year for you, I believe, and for all of us. Honestly, I am really trying very, very hard to understand 
how some people arrived at the conclusion that critical race theory is a threat. What is it threatening? Your sense of yourselves, white privilege, your understanding of a particular history that doesn't include the history or stories of other people? Or is it just simply a tool like a key that opens up the door that says, let's ask these critical questions, prepares our students to ask those critical questions about race and racism and how they function and why they function in particular ways. Please, please, let's stop rewriting history. Stop trying to convince people that slavery was good because only 16 Africans were first brought here. No, I am an African. People were taken from my community. Slavery did not help. It hasn't helped. The fact that we have to wait, African Americans have to wait or plead and work every so often to say, let's please honor those amendments to the Constitution, three of them, 13th, 14th, 15th, every so often. And you want to tell me, we don't want to talk about why they have to do that? What does that mean? The fact that Native Americans had to wait till the 70s to practice their own religion? Hello? And you want to tell me that we should not be asking these questions? Oh, by the way, how many of you here drink coffee or eat chocolate? Have you ever asked who produces them? The cotton that make up your fabric, your clothes? Do you ask those questions? We're talking critical race theory. I take students, American students, to South Africa, predominantly white students to South Africa. When we get there, I want to tell you, they are shocked at what they see and they're shocked at the fact that there is so much information about them, not just the Africans, not African Americans, that suddenly, oh my God, here we're dealing with race relations in South Africa, which is very much like what is happening here in the United States. Do you know what they say to me when they come back? That has helped me understand what is going on. I did not have the opportunity to talk minutes. to people in the US. I do have your students who are upset that the school system did not prepare them enough for the world that they are going to encounter. And it is a world that is global, that is changing, Please wrap up your that is different. I'm going to back up. So thank you for acknowledging Martin Luther King and citing him, but refusing to acknowledge that the very thing that you like about him is the thing that you're challenging right now. Critical race theory comments. is not associated with Marxism. It started before Marxism, which originates in the 19th century. Get the history right. So thank Please you. Please wrap up your comments. Thank you. Next is Alana Kailishin. Oh, OK. Thank you very much. Um, next is Tara Leonard. I'm Tara Leonard. I um, live in Mount Pleasant. I, again, didn't prepare anything. I just listen. Um, I did find it interesting that adults can't even sit in a room and keep their mouths quiet while this is being taught. So maybe that's something to think about as well when we're going to teach this to children who are, um, you know, peer pressure and bullying and all of that when there are women behind me booing another woman talking, so that was interesting. Um, the other thing that I find really interesting is that maybe some of you don't know that the health, the Michigan Health Department has um, came up with a program called the Michigan Safer Schools that they are wanting to implement into the school system um, for children. I'm unclear of the ages. I thought that I saw a 10 to 19, but I'm not sure um, to be, if they are not vaccinated, to be COVID tested twice a week. Um, so I think the critical race theory is at everybody's forefront, but that is the thing that is uh, most um, 
scary, I guess, to me. Um, my son, I have three kids that go while well, my stepson just graduated, but um, I asked my son, what is the reason that you wouldn't want to be tested for COVID if you had to do this? And he said, well, because I'm not sick. And I just thought that that was such a simple statement. And we're talking so much about critically thinking. And if we're critically thinking about giving tests twice a week to um, children, why don't we critically think, well, they're not sick, so why would we even force that on them? Um, I asked my daughter the same thing, and she said, my body, my choice, which was an, a different spin that I thought of, especially with a girl, a young girl, we're talking about, um, you know, choices that you're making with your body, and um, no means no, and um, all of these different things we've talked about since she was a little girl, and now if she says no to a recommended test that she doesn't want to take, it might be implemented anyways, um, which is just another thing to think about. Um, my son was quarantined three times last year. He was supposed to be isolated for 42 days, self-isolated. Um, what the health department and the school told me, he needs to stay by himself, not have any contact with anybody, not go anywhere for 42 days within a four-month span. So that's over a month of he would have just had to been sitting by himself, not talking to anybody or seeing anybody, and he wasn't sick. So um, obviously, if we have these tests implemented, then there are going to be more quarantines um, and more self-isolation after a year when these kids were already isolated enough. Um, another thing that I found interesting was when the whole sports got put on hold um, and the whole let them play movement, I didn't hear anything from the schools. I didn't, didn't hear them um, fighting for sports. And we saw those numbers. Um, seniors were 41%. That's a huge population of the school, of each grade. And I didn't hear anything from the school board. I didn't hear any from the, anything minutes. from Please the schools to let them play. Um, that was my son's livelihood. That's all he wanted to do was play basketball. And instead I got several, or I guess a few emails inviting my children to um, be part of the critical um, gender and sexuality alliance. Please wrap up your comments. Um, so I would just like to make sure that the school board and the schools have the kids' best interest in their forefront. Um, get down to real critical thinking of what the best thing is for each of our students. And thank you very much. Thank you. Next is Amy Ford. Hello, I'm glad to hear about the curriculum review. I believe that all of our children and youth in our schools deserve to see themselves reflected in the curriculum. Research shows that diversifying the curriculum has the potential to build empathy across differences and make visible the diversity within groups. In contrast, a Eurocentric curriculum sends the message that only white perspectives, experiences, worldviews, and lives matter. And as a parent of a child in the Mount Pleasant schools, I'm eager for her to learn about people who are different. That will help prepare her for the world. I'm glad to hear that this curriculum review will build on the work of the PSC and in moving forward, I'm eager for the task force that is assembled to include stakeholders from the student body. And I hope that the body of the task force will reflect the demographics of the student body as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next is Eric Sharecover.
Uh, thank you. Um, I'll just set a timer here since uh, I get the sense that, yeah. Uh, I, um, I didn't prepare any remarks, but I thought I would just, um, well, wing it. I, um, I'm deeply disturbed by much of what I've heard tonight. Um, before I, uh, well, I'd like to say first of all that um, it's, it's, I, it saddens me that you, the board, and uh, obviously the teachers uh, in in uh, in the sc in the school system are um, caught in the uh, the crossfire of some sort of cultural war that that's unnecessary. Um, to me, the idea of just in terms of in, in, in looking at your presentation of the culturally responsive curriculum, um, I, I see nothing wrong with it. I, I think it's great for us to put our, ourselves in other people's shoes. Um, view things from a different perspective. I know, and, and I, I'm sorry, I, I, I forget your name, the uh, university professor who talked about critical race theory, but I think that's more the purview of um, uh, post-secondary education. Uh, I don't think critical race theory is actually something that's ensconced in our current public school system. So uh, a lot of people are really against something that um, isn't happening. So again, to me, sort of a manufactured um, crisis, if you will. Um, I have a 14, my, my Eric Cherkover, sorry, I live here in town, nine years. I have a 14 and a 16 year old, uh, 14 year old uh, son, 16 year old daughter. Uh, they have educated me many times about the things that I have said and done wrong in terms of my response to diversity. They have taught me to, um, to be a better person and those lessons can be pretty hard. Uh, history is messy, and hard lessons are sometimes a bitter pill to swallow, but you come away from those lessons a better person, even though if at the moment you really wish your 16-year-old or your 14-year-old wasn't schooling you, but they have a certain wisdom. Um, and I'd also, also like to say on a personal note with respect to COVID, the testing, um, the vaccination, uh, equating that with wearing a yellow star on your shirt in Nazi Germany is profoundly offensive. You don't even have to be Jewish to find that offensive, but I happen to be, so I thought I'd just say that. Thanks for your time. That concludes the citizen's request to address the board, and now we move on to the Board of Education discussion. Does anyone have anything to discuss tonight? Okay, uh, none being said. I would just like to mention that the month of July is one of the months that we only have one board meeting. Um, so that being said, our next board meeting will be on July 19th. Um, and I'm sorry. Um, and uh, we will be having it here still. Um, it will uh, most likely be here, but it will be announced where the location um, is, and um, you can check the website for the location in the future. Um, with that being said, thank you for attending tonight, and I hope everyone has a good evening. I call this meeting adjourned. <laughs>